brings us to nitro the sooner we start the sooner we'll finish w making good time here tonight good we can spend some time on this one i'll do our best fortunately nothing happened <laughs> oh <laughs> well i mean a lot seven thousand ha- things a happened. lot happened but there was like there's nothing memorable about this show i really know uh let's see wcw monday nitro number 220 december 6th 1999 jared comes out for an interview with me and gene he is sick of Dustin Rhodes screwing him over. Wants to end his career at Starcade in one of his horn yacker matches, a bunkhouse match. Says if Dustin doesn't want to fight me, I'll fight Bret Hart. I'll fight Goldberg. I'll even fight Mike Tanay. I was already so lost. <laughs> like Jeff Jarrett wants to face Dustin Rhodes on the way to becoming the WCW champion. That's his plan. He has a pay per view match. That's his plan. What the fuck's going on here? So Jarrett, what's a horn yacker? I don't, we never got that answered. I think that's one of Vince's favorite words, actually. Hornyak. McMahon or Russo? Yeah, McMahon. Yeah. Well, that would explain. Why. Well, so he starts to threaten Gene with his guitar. The crowd's cheering this. They want to see the old man hit with a guitar. Tanae storms out. He stands up to Jarrett. Jarrett backs down and says, I don't need any lawsuits. Last week was just a misunderstanding. Well, this is already stupid. Then as soon as Tanae turns around, Jarrett jumps him. Yeah. I guess he does need a lawsuit. He puts Tanae in the figure four. He's getting sued for sure, I guess. And then Goldberg saves. The Italian gangsters have some kind of confrontation in the world's most echoey place. Tony Mamaluke says, no more screw-ups. I need Disco and Lash LaRue to meet the big boss tonight. Do we ever find out who the big boss is? I don't know. I, don't... I honestly don't remember anything in no. this era. I remember. I don't it remember. It is a hodgepodge of <laughs> just bullshit. I remember. I remember Vito and Johnny the Bull. Yeah, I remember them. Mainly because there's cool theme song we got later. I forgot totally that Tony Marinero was ever a part of it. I remember Tony Mamaluke. Yeah. Remember he got pulled through the guardrail. That yeah, but I thought. That was I remember WCW. that. No, that was. It happens in WCW. I'm almost positive it does. But anyway, we had our first. Wacky- what in the <laughs> fuck was this? <laughs> wow. I was so mad when I saw this. So last week on this fucking show. Finley beats Brian Knobs and cuts all his hair off. Right, right. All right. I'm thinking, well, what the hell will the follow-up be this week? So Finley is in the woods. First, Knobs is in the woods. No, 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 no. Don't cut this off, Vinny. How dare you? Can you can you scratch that from the record, Rob? That's what we... Okay. 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 Let me tell this fucking story. Fine. When I looked at the screen, motherfucker, I saw Finley in the woods. Okay? All right. Finley's in the woods, and he's wearing some sort of outfit. Like a military outfit. Okay, right? sure. And he's screaming at somebody that are going to be working hard. And he's screaming at him. He's saying, get going on this thing, blah, 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 blah. Finley. Okay, I'm listening. Okay. I thought, he must be training Norman Smiley. He must be trying to toughen up Norman Smiley and make him into a badass. So he's shouting all of these whatever. And who should walk up but Brian Knobs? Why are you looking at me like that? You missed the first 30 seconds of this. I did. When Brian Knobs, in a shirt reading Nasty Boys, is stomping through the woods, looking for Finley like he's looking for Sasquatch. I, I realize that, Vinny. Okay. But my point is, I did miss that. Okay. okay? Yes. So in my brain, I thought Finley must be training like Norman Smiley. He's a coward, right? He's yes. afraid of everything. Yes. Okay, so he's going to train and become a tough guy with Finley. Then I find out Finley's training Knobs? Why the fuck are these two guys together? Why is Knobs training with Fit Finley? <laughs> I don't, because Finley cut his hair last week. That's the fucking dumbest thing I've ever heard in I my know. life. Why is he out here being humiliated and trained by Fit Finley? I was so mad when I watched this. I didn't get it at all. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, sometimes I watch this shit and it's stupid, but I can at least figure out what stupid thing was in somebody's mind when they came up with it. This, I'm baffled. How did Finley cutting his hair off lead to him becoming a drill sergeant for Brian Knobs? What? And why are they in the woods? What the fuck are they doing in the woods? 
train like Rocky. And then Finley's yelling at him going, you, you almost had my leg chopped off. So Nobbs is like making this up to you? Or this is like a lawsuit? I don't have an answer. Like there was like a settlement that involves you training in the fucking woods with Fit Finley? What the fuck is going on here? Why did this make me so mad? I don't know. I'm sweating. Back in the arena, out of the woods. And I have no memory of it. <laughs> you, you don't remember Fit Philly and Brian Knobs training in the woods? <laughs> no. That's amazing to me. And I remember a lot. I'm being sarcastic, by the way. I also that. forgot this woods segment. Well, I'm never going to forget it again because I've ranted so long and hard about it. I mean, maybe I missed it the first time. <laughs> this is a better Nitro, everyone. <laughs> that part wasn't. <laughs> Norman Smiley comes out. This is a cosmic coincidence that I think I'm the only one in the room who would get. Maybe Rob. Did you miss did you miss a segment with Kurt Henning and Curly Bill and Probably no, that's later. Uh, no, nah, I don't think so. Oh, what? they aired it twice. Shane got hired. Yeah, they aired it twice on the okay. show. So we don't need to talk about it the first time. Okay. They aired the same exact video twice. Somehow I mi- somehow I missed the first one. Yeah. I, I don't know. I was okay. probably still furiously writing about Brian Knobs and missed the first one. So Nor- they're in uh, Wisconsin. Norman Smiley comes out in a Mark Tamura jersey. I can't even say his name. Tamura jersey, who has not been in the news for 20 years. And then suddenly this week, he's back in the headlines again because he had crazy mean things to say about their current quarterback. He threatens to kick Finley's booty. Norman Smiley does, not Mark Tamura. Issues an open challenge. Out comes Rhonda Singh. That's S I N G, Rhonda Singh, by the way. <laughs> so they're having a hardcore match. She hits him in the head over and over and over again with weapons. Who was the uh, football guy that was on Raw last night? Or not the football guy. The uh-huh. uh, he's a he's a he's a singer. The country singer. Yeah, it's country singers performing at Never the uh, tribute to the life. troops. Yeah, they spelled his fucking name wrong. Excellent. Yeah, because okay. this is Nitro. It's Thunder. Remember who I think who the rapper was, but he got attacked and they're like, "That's not a superstar." <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Who was it? I, it was not a fam- he was not a superstar, as it turns out. It was um um what that fucking guy's name? Machine Gun Kelly. Machine Gun Kelly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who yeah. well, actually did a hell of a job? He was a superstar to me. Okay, cool. So Rhonda hits Norman in the head with weapons over and over and over again, and finally he picks up like a trash can and hits her with this giant shot to the head, and everyone goes crazy. Yep, you people. It the, it sucked for Norman because he's wearing shoulder pads, he's got pads in his pants, and Rhonda's hitting him with a kendo stick. And somehow missing the shoulder pads and just hitting him in the back. The only spot that's exposed. And the head. She hit him in the head a lot, too. Gosh. Uh, she blows a fire extinguisher in his face, which is awesome because it left him with a white mustache for the rest yes. of the match. No, nothing else, mind you. <laughs> it didn't stick to his face or his hair or his beard. Just a mustache. Uh, so there's a table set up in the corner. He whips her into it. She goes through it. And then for about 20 seconds, he's looking for something. And then it says, eh, fuck it. And he pins her. Yeah, it was weird. Awful, I wrote. It was very bad. So in all the- Oh, my God. <laughs> Fucking the maestro's alive again. In all the insanity of the last two or three weeks, we've never gotten into the maestro. <laughs> There's a guy who is backstage playing piano every week for some reason. And he has a girl for some reason. Yeah. And David Flair hates them for some reason. Well, I mean, it's obvious. Hey, it's everybody. Okay. okay. And the guy does nothing but play the piano and make six figures. I'd want to kick his ass too. <laughs> anyway, he's alive again. He got he got he, he's fine. He was Last up time we saw him, he was body. bound and gagged inside a piano. His inside. body was inside the piano. Yeah. So Are you saying a soul was somewhere else? Uh, well, I'm just pointing out he's that doing asshole projection now? He was dead, dude. I see. Fuck. Well, he's here now. Well, he's back alive again. He got better. I've seen weirder things on this show. <laughs> That's fair. So he's alive and he says, My piano's out of tune. I've got to look in under the hood. Right. All right. So he goes to look under the hood. What's happened? This is, you're not lying. David shows up, kidnaps Symphony, mm-hmm. and he drops a piano lid on the Symphony, or on the uh, Maestro, right. who falls down. Fucking terrible. Yeah. You understand me? And he kidnaps Symphony. Yeah. Terrible. So, we, something we've talked about many, many times over the years, Vince Russo outright says that he loves it when friends fight. Yeah. <laughs> he just is clear about that. So... He tells Parka and Psychosis, Hoovy got hurt. I need one of you to fill in tonight against Juice and Liger. So, I love it when friends fight. I know you're friends. So I'm going to make you fight. The winner is going to be the first one who walks out of this room. At this point, Parker starts to protest. Psychosis just walks towards the door. I was hoping he would just leave. Yeah. <laughs> He'd win. 
But no, he jumps the parka. For about 10 seconds, they had actually a really great fight. Parker did a really cool takedown in this fight, but he still lost. Parker's a crazy fucker. Yeah. I, um, yeah. And uh, he still lost, and Psychosis walks out the door, and he wins. So he will face Liger later. Bret Hart arrives looking absolutely miserable. <laughs> this poor... F- I'll get to him later. <laughs> Lex goes to... I love this. <laughs> Lex goes to Elizabeth's room. He sheepishly knocks, you know, the back part of his uh. hand on the door. Liz, I've got champagne. La- last week, he threw her in gravy or mud or whatever they had. Yeah, he's trying yeah. to make it up to her by giving her wine. She mm-hmm. won't listen. She tells him to go away. He's, he's pleading to her heart about their friendship. How it's a defining moment in both our careers, he says. Finally, he says, I brought champagne. And she opens the door. <laughs> Classic. Tony Mamaluke or Marinara, whatever the hell he's supposed to be. He's in his office. He has an office at Nitro. There's a knock on the door, and it's in the exact same voice that said, uh, Candy Graham, in the Land Shark skit on Saturday Night Live, mm-hmm. pizza delivery. Tony stands up and says, who gets a pizza in Milwaukee? I, this stunned me. I was at Target on Sunday night. Target sells something called Milwaukee pizza. Really? It's a thing. What is it? I, I had, like, uh, onions. I, 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 it looked like a pizza to me. I don't know what made a Milwaukee pizza, hmm. but... So again, Rob furiously. Googling I was just. This. Th- it can't be good. It's a Target. That's fair. <laughs> that is fair. I didn't say it was good pizza, but maybe somebody at Target was watching Nitro in 1999 and said, "Why? Why can't Milwaukee?" Okay, we don't pizza? have that much time. <laughs> so he opens the door. Disco and Lash say hi. That's all that happens. <laughs> Juice and Liger versus Psychosis. Man, they actually tried. Fans are chanting, "Boring." Dude, they're working their asses off. Luger with a Liger with a dive off the post. Sakosa's top rope drop kick. Finally, at the end, the people yes. start to get into it. Yes, and Liger hits cradle, pins him, wins the title back. Mm. Buzz kills. There is a buzz kill in the crowd. Yep. Holy smokes! I got nothing to add. What do you got, Rob? So would you like? To- would you like to know what the uh, Milwaukee style pizza is? That's your job, All my right. man. Excellent. According to this website, it says a thin cracker crust, buttery and crispy. Loads of thick, shredded mozzarella. Bags, bags to be cut in squares, a.k.a. a party cut. So it's pizza. Seemingly. Hmm. Thank you, Vinny. Don't blame me. Blame Target. <laughs> I blame the five minutes we wasted on that. Yeah, but now we know. The Nitro We'll girls- forget tomorrow. Do you think Vinny's going to remember this tomorrow? When I say, Vinny, do you remember what a Milwaukee pizza is? I will not remember the definition. He'll go, cut in squares. You won't even remember that. I probably won't. I will. Reminds me of Little Caesars. <laughs> well, then you learn something. They always uh, cut them in squares. Maybe Little Caesars is from Milwaukee. Little Caesars is shit pizza. It, yes, is, it is horrible, dude. Little Caesars I'll go and Chuck E. Cheese. They killed Pietro's in the Northwest, and for this, or Washington State at least. And for this, oh. I will never forgive them. The, I feel like there's a Pietro's down by there are a few in Longview. Oregon. There's a few in Oregon. Longview, I think there's one. They're my, by the mall. There's still Shakey's in uh, Renton. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. No, Petros is awesome. The, the, the ones I know are in Oregon. There might be one down in Vancouver's across the border. So. There is one. I'm telling you right now. Well, we'll do a road trip then. All right. Let's go now. No. You? You're begging to get out of here and I get to drive to Longview? Yeah, I was kidding, Brian. All right, let's get going here. The Nitro girls are ragging on Spice when Vito and Johnny the Bull show up and invite them to play a game of strip poker. And the girls accept. Oh, this will go well. <laughs> Always does. Lex is pleading his case. To Liz, how they should be a team again. What's the train without the caboose, he says. And then he goes, <laughs> wrong choice of words. That's what he said. What's a bagel he, without cream cheese? He had all day to prepare his speech. <laughs> yeah. That's what he did. Hey, he got not the champagne right. What else do you want from him? She's not into it. The maestro is storming through the backstage area of the arena, screaming for symphony. <laughs> it's fucking horrible. It's hilariously so awful. So bad. He's so... Like, I can't tell if he's horrible or if he just knows he's doing something horrible. So he's just playing it up to be as horrible as possible. You can't. Well, one way or the other, this is horrible. <laughs> you can't, I laughed. You my can't ass half-ass off. horrible. No. If you're doing something horrible, you have to go all the way with the horrible. I howled at this fucking segment. <laughs> Pervy Jean is staring at Mona's boobs. I mean, not even like, you know, look in her eyes and... No. I mean, he's like... Ugh. It's the way it was leering in his defense. They said, Jean, make sure you stare at her tits this whole time. Well, sure, of course. And she says, I'm a lot more than TNA. I'm a lot more than TNA. I'm going to prove tonight a woman can survive and win in a man's world. 
<laughs> Sorry for the emotion. It's acting like IQ from Star Blazers. <laughs> I did love that show growing up. It was a great show. Yeah, she did a horrible robotic promo. She was more wooden than robotic. More wooden than robotic. Yeah. But uh, I can't really do it. But yeah, she promised. So she has a three away with Evan and Medusa, a wrestling match. Uh, oh, hold on. Wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay. <laughs> yes. I'm almost as mad as I am. Oh, it's right here. Right? We talk about it. About that fucking Fit Finley deal. Okay. Mm-hmm. So Evan Courageous, Medusa, and Mona come down to the ring. Yeah. All right. right. Tony Schiavone is under the impression it's a three-way match. Yes. Okay. Tony Schiavone says, this is a three-way match with the winner getting a shot at Evan Courageous at the pay-per-view. That's correct. Evan's in the motherfucking match. He did say at one point, if Evan wins, he gets the night off or something. Fucking A. Fuck you. So then Evan goes to do commentary. (laughs) Ah. Okay. Now Tony is baffled. He can't figure this out. Well, I thought it was a three-way. Evan explained something, but he has no mic. So Evan he, was you can't poor. hear oh, that too. Yeah, and finally, like we don't know what he said, so the, the women just start wrestling. So finally, I'm like, okay, <laughs> this is a fucking disaster. But like, all right, it's a it's a women's match. Winner gets Evan. They do this goddamn match, and all of a sudden, Evan jumps in the fucking ring, and Medusa pins him. Right, he was in the match after all. Yeah, it was a three way. Yes, I hate this show. Okay. Even worse than that, last That's week... impossible. Last week, we saw Evan and Medusa making out. She, he did promise this. Yeah. And he said, I'll give you a match. Well, she asked for a match. Apparently, the basically said, championship I'll bang committee. you if you give me a match. Championship committee did not okay this, I guess. Ridiculous. And then Jarrett you waffles don't say. Medusa with a shot with the belt and challenges Goldberg. We were 30, sec- 30 minutes into the show. The two biggest reactions have been for men hitting women with weapons. Yep. This is an unpleasant show to watch. Uh, we, do we talk about how horrible Evan was on commentary? Yeah. Yes. Brian did. My favorite was when somebody throws a kick and his response was, quote, looks like kick time in there. Yeah. Captain of, key, of Queen Kick. Team Kick? Whatever. Whatever. That Actually, Captain of Team Kick is better than looks like, looks like kick time in there. Can you imagine if Dakota Kikes came out and said, looks like kick time? <laughs> Disco and Lash have Tony tied up. Yeah. <laughs> when you have one guy whose gimmick is that he's a disco dancer, and one guy whose gimmick is that he's Cajun, mm. why is the Cajun wearing the shiny silver shirt? Because he's a star. They promise they have a surprise for Tony. Yeah, and, and Disco's there like a, a blue turtleneck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like he's ready for a PBS Christmas show or something. <laughs> so they promise they have a surprise for Tony. Liz agrees to team with Lex. Gene interviews... No, no, no. Mm-hmm. She agreed to team with him, but then she grabs the champagne, pours it all over his head. Yes. Oh, you're right. There's yeah. so much going on, I forgot to write that down. Yes. That's an important little... It is. ...bit of the storyline. You're right. There was so much going on, I forgot to write down important stuff. <laughs> Gene interviews Vampiro and Jerry only. It was Vampiro being a scary guy, cutting a promo. It was fine. Dr. Death in Oklahoma versus Vampiro and Jerry only. All right, so Jerry only was pretty bad in this match. Not going to lie. Thank you. This hilarious attempt at a sunset flip. <laughs> Is that what that was? I was laughing so hard. It was like a turtle stuck on his back, but he was on his front. The best part it's actually of this true. match. If you took a turtle up, anyway, yeah. There was actually something really good in this match, and that was Oklahoma with the mic. Doing his own commentary. I said doing his own commentary for his own match. Yeah. It was hilarious. The best part was, he comes out. Now, I'm not uh, Rick Rude myself, so... There's no. a, a little bit of a pot calling the kettle black, but mm-hmm. Oklahoma comes out, and he's just the fattest, flabbiest, hairiest fucker you've ever seen on Nitro. No tan. Just pale white tits and hair everywhere. The tan was the least of his fucking problems. <laughs> hey, tan fat looks better than pale fat. Everybody knows that. <laughs> I think I saw that in a fortune cookie once. So Oklahoma's got the mic gimmick. And he, he's not doing like, house mic commentary. Only we at home can hear it. But he's... You know, Doc go to tackle, and he'll go, tackle, tackle, tackle. And he gets in there for his own stuff, and just a little bit, mostly it was all just like, he, he says, I'm a baby face, fire! And he fires up, and as soon as Vampiro approached him, he tagged out. And after doing nothing, he did say, I'm a trouble, guys, I'm blown up already. <laughs> that was funny. I laughed at that. So, Oklahoma sucks, Jerry only sucks, so of course, at least one of them is in the ring at all times. <laughs> 
At least, uh, or at the, finally, well, Doc. Let's cut and, to the damn chase here. Doc and Vampire get there. And Oklahoma hits Jerry only with a chair outside. Thank God. Doc destroys Vamp, and then Oklahoma goes up top, hits a fucking flying elbow for the win. Hit a bottom rope, pull the straps down elbow for the win. Yep. Oklahoma. Let me just repeat this, everybody. Mm-hmm. Oklahoma pinned Vampiro mm-hmm. and got his hat back. Yeah. He gained revenge on the baby faces mm-hmm. for how they had wronged him as a heel. Are they the baby faces? Yes. Are you sure? Was there, I'm, I'm almost positive Oklahoma and Dr. Death are I don't think there are any baby faces. Was there uh, anything that's, that's possible? Was there anything in Vamp's promo while he was wearing Oklahoma's hat about Oklahoma's hat? I thought he was just a damn cowboy. The, until they mentioned it, I thought he was wearing it. Honestly, he made it work. <laughs> he really did. He did. The Nitro Girls are cheating at strip poker. Disco and Lash. Are that went over my head. I thought they were winning. No, they pulled a card out of Fire's cleavage. Thank oh, you. Yeah, yeah, that's cheating. Yeah. Disco and Lash are preparing to tar and feather Tony Marinara. Lex Luger is walking. Bret Hart is walking. Gene interviews the Outsiders. Tonight, Scott Hall fights Sting and Nash fights Benoit. At the pay-per-view, Hall fights Benoit. Nash fights Sid. They're not concerned about any of this. Bret Hart versus Lex Luger. Crouch chaining Shivani sucks. The announcers are saying this could be the most important match of Lex Luger's career. Why? Because he'll win the world championship? No. Because the winner, whoever's champion, gets a shot at Goldberg at the pay per view. Yeah, this is a. Before this match, they. You may have mentioned this, I wasn't paying attention. Why is would Nash you? versus Sid in a powerbomb match at Starcade? Yes. What? Well. The winner can only win via. Power bomb. The first one to hit a power bomb okay. wins. Do you know how hard it is to do a match where near falls don't count, <laughs> count outs don't count? Yep. Literally nothing counts except hitting a move. Yeah. Okay, that's hard. And you do that shit with Sid and Kevin Nash. It sure are. Fuck. Yeah. So nobody cared about this match until Liz came out, but then Sting was right behind her. He told her, gave her an ultimatum: "You're with me or you're with Lex." She followed him to the back. Lex was caught off guard by this and shocked. And so Brett hits him with the side arson leg sweep and the sharpshooter for the win. Okay. Uh, going back one segment, you said that Disco and Lash are getting ready mm-hmm. to tar and feather Tony Marinara. I did say that very casually. Yes. All right. Uh, Brian, Matt, you're interrupting me. I'm sorry, but I just have to get this out. Kevin Nash said vicious minus one star. Okay. Thank there you, Brian. You okay. So they're getting ready. Do tar and feather. They don't do the tar and feathering. I know, spoiler alert, till later on in the show. What happened in all that time in between? Sat around. Shot the shit. This is the worst Be-bopped. thing ever. They show what's going to happen, and then it's like that segment is put on pause <laughs> until they come back to it well, and unpause it. They have, to, they have to just spread it out over 18 different segments, Craig. Fuck, this show is so horrible. <laughs> you just realized that? God damn, they got a Revolution versus Duggan in the Varsity Club. The minus, what? Minus one star. Yes. Yeah, ha- but between like Wait, now, now and next week. Are you com- com- confusing nope. your notes from one show to the other? Between now and next week, Mike Rotundo, Rick, Kevin Sullivan, and Rick Steiner are a team. What? <laughs> next week, Vinny. Don't worry. <laughs> we got Vampiro versus Oklahoma. Minus star and a quarter, which is somehow worse than the Master of the Powerbomb match, which got minus it's one Oklahoma. star. It's Oklahoma. Somehow. Uh, well. He's I mean, worse than Nash and Sid. I guess, but... <laughs> He's clearly worse than Nash and Sid. Fucking A. We should not watch that. No! Good idea. All right, where are we? The Kurt Hennig segment that I, I, I finally saw for the first time. Uh, he wants them to hire Curly Bill. Curly Bill has a great idea for a gimmick. He says this. I got a great idea for a gimmick. Shane. Russo says, fine, minimum wage. <laughs> He's down with it. Just not for a lot of money. Just Shane. And then Ronda wants an opportunity. Ronda Singh, not yeah, Ronda Rousey. Yeah, we'd for that, yes. Yeah, they, got, they have a Vince and a Shane now, along with... Well, they had a Vince. Yeah. Vince is Shane. Now they, now they got a Shane. Oh, Vince Russo. And then they got Gerald and... Oh, Midnight's walking around backstage. Midnight and her abs looking for Harlem Heat. Russo likes La Parca, calls him Skeletor, makes him his official chairman. Says, yeah. when I do this, hit a guy with your chair. Harlem Heat come in. Russo says, you can have a title shot at Starcade. And he does this. And Parker hits him with a chair, and Creative Control joins the beating. Piper arrives in a limo, and some guy was with him, and I was trying to figure out who, and then he never saw him again. Was it fair play? 
Probably, actually. Was that kid from Portland that used to hang around? Lewis Rock? It wasn't Thank Lewis you. Rock. It was not Lewis Rock. Definitely okay. not Lewis it Rock. It might have been Johnny Fairplay. I'm not sure. But some guy. David has Symphony trapped in the basement somewhere. Do we... I, I don't even remember it down. There is a point in the show where... When uh, the maestro is going through the hallway screaming Symphony's name, mm-hmm. and David and Symphony appear behind him and then disappear, and the cameraman doesn't let Maestro know your girlfriend who has been kidnapped by a crowbar wielding lunatic is behind you. That's your fucking problem. How about the cameraman right here in the basement filming this in the basement and not doing a goddamn thing about it? Same thing. Yes. I'm sick of this show. I may wrap it up right now. <laughs> I don't know if I can finish this. Gene interviews Jerry Flynn. Flynn is upset Berlin broke the rule of the block. Fuck. This was an open challenge. Yeah, he explains rule. It's two men enter. It's not three. Not three. Not three. <laughs> <laughs> the revolutionary now militia come out in tactical gear. Was remind me was fly burning topical in 1999? I don't know. They're going off about. It's always topical. They have well, there was a time when it was really, really in the news. Every this day. is where Shane dropped the s bomb. It wasn't on the other show. No, Hunter said shit when he was talking about his dad. Okay, there, there, there's plenty of shit to go around in 1999. <laughs> so Revolution have their own flag now. Asia I versus bet they sold a bunch of those. <laughs> <laughs> Asia versus Midnight. Hey, Midnight. A hell of an athlete. What a hell of an athlete. And Asia, too. They're doing kip-ups. They're doing... The green is beyond the greenest grass you ever saw, but there's there's talent here. I think Midnight may have thrown the greatest leapfrog I've ever seen in my entire life. I'm not even joking. She was... That may have been the greatest leapfrog I have ever seen. And she's not small. No, she is She's tall and thick and muscular and can move. The revolution is trying to cheer Asia on by clapping the mat in unison. The whitest moment in the history of pro wrestling. The clapping was way too hard for them. So Patrick is pulled out of the ring. The revolution attacks Midnight. For the third time on the show, a man attacks a woman with a weapon. Hacksaw makes the save. At least he's a real 2 by 4 this week. They all beat him up. They take the flag they introduced 10 minutes ago, and they lay it over his body. Larry Zabisco arrives, talks to Mike. What the hell is the guy's last name? Graham. Mike Graham. Graham, thank you. So I'm here to talk to the powers that be. Piper's going crazy backstage. It's writing about wrestling people with condoms on their heads. I guess because creative control are bald. I assume that's what that... That's, yeah. yeah. Okay. That's thought, a strange joke. I thought that was later in TNA. I love when Piper thinks he's so clever. But really, it's just like, he has what some, the fuck are you talking <laughs> he's about? He's just out of his mind. They bring back ni- the Nitro Party clips. I was so mad till I found out what this was. <laughs> See? They go, yes, Here's something we haven't done for six, seven months. Yeah. Nitro Party. Let's go to the tape. Daphne Unger. Yes. She's sitting there. Oh, I think David Flair's totally cool. It's like, oh, how about that? They did not They did not do weeks of the Nitro Party, and then the third one's the crackpot. No, they, they, they jumped right into the crazy. Yeah, hey, we got a good one this week. Let's put this one on the air. <laughs> she likes David Flair. She's the one. Okay, I'm going to read this, and you're going to think, listener, that I am making a mistake. This is the match. Roddy Piper... In a handicap match versus creative control with himself as ref. I'll say it again in case I lost you. Roddy Piper versus creative control with himself as the referee. I hate Why this. was there a match? Why didn't he just why? claim himself to be the winner? Why did, why did Russo, who hates Piper, make Piper his own ref? That seems Fuck dumb. If I fucking know. So Piper does a I bunch of goofy comedy about they have to do what he says and he'll DQ them. He's so good at this wacky shit, and people loved it. Mm-hmm. So then he makes it an I Quit match. And he starts to fight. He goes for their balls, their eyes, their fingers. Finally. You're, you're, you're underselling that. He poked one in the eye. He hit the other one in the crotch, and he looks at the crowd. And he goes, I'm having a ball. Yeah. And he cracked himself up. It was the Three Stooges here. Uh, finally, they double team him. They're about to do a pile driver on a chair when Goldberg saves. He hits a spear. And he does, like, the worst jackhammer oh. anyone's ever done. Okay, listen. So he bad. grabs a Harris, and he lifts him up, and he starts to lose him. Yes, he does. And he turns, and he still starts to lose him. He actually drops the guy, stomach first, on the top rope, mm-hmm. hoists him back up again, can't get him all the way up, and finally just slams the guy. Did you see how he got him up? The Harris twin kicked off the turnbuckle to get himself Well, over. at least he was smart enough to do that. Right. Listen, I've never seen Goldberg fuck up a jackhammer ever. I have seen so him. So guess what? It's not his fault. No. 
I have seen him jackhammer the big show. Yes. That's very true. So this was so bad, people were actually booing Goldberg. And then Piper choked a dude with a belt and won. Tony Marinara begs for mercy. He doesn't get any. They started talking. I understood nothing because there was no mics. Okay. So there's a strip poker game with two dudes and a bunch of hot chicks. And you're making a TV show where you want wrestling fans to tune in in droves. Right. Where your on-character character says all he wants is ratings. Mm-hmm. The women have gained clothing as the night has gone on. The dudes are just about naked. Mm-hmm. Yes. Funny, though. Ha, ha, ha. The maestro finds a shoe. Yeah. Like Cinderella. Dustin Rhodes versus Ming. Jeff Whoa, J- hold on. First, we had Disco and Lash, Tar and Feather, Tony, Mama Luke. They literally tarred and feathered the guy. Yeah. Well, molasses and feathered. Then we have Vito and Johnny still losing. They offer double or nothing. All the underwear's on the line. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Then we had Maestro finding the shoe. Uh, so Dustin Rhodes versus Ming. Jeff Jarrett runs in for the DQ. Tony Schiavone says, and I quote, you can almost feel that one coming. <laughs> All in Nash are down. They save Jarrett. Jarrett hits Ming with a guitar shot. Ming doesn't sell it. Nash boots him. Nash power bombs Dustin. Is this show over yet? Nash power bombs Dustin. Dustin's a very big man. He's almost as big as Nash. And they shot this from the worst camera angle possible to make it clear how impressive this was. <sighs> oh, here we go. Now we got a segment. <laughs> Allow me. <laughs> Russo wants to talk to Larry Zbysko. Larry Zbysko walks in. Russo says, Larry, thunder sucks. Larry says, yeah, it sucks. It sucks because you're putting it together. There are no stars on this show. Russo says, well, that's all going to change on Thursday on Thunder. We're going to make it special again. All the big stars are going to be there. Goldberg, Sting, Luger, they're all going to be there. And you know what, Larry? You suck. I'm replacing you. Larry says, the announcers are the only things on the show that make any sense. He says, I don't need this stupid job. I do this to give back to the fans. Hennig's right there. Hennig's rolling his eyes. Larry goes, I don't need this job for 30 glorious years. And as soon as he says glorious years, Hennig rolls his eyes. So Larry's like, hey, fuck you. So they start arguing. And so Russo says, all right, tonight, Larry, you're facing Kurt. And if you lose Larry, you're fired. Larry goes, well, hold on a second. That's not fair. What if I win? If I win, you have to go back to WWF. He doesn't say WWF. Some bridge is what he said. So Russo says, fine, let's do it. And you know what I wrote that time? I said, Larry should have shot on him. (laughs) Little did I know that he actually won. I was astounded when Larry won. But then it was bullshit, as we'll get to. So... Prince Ike is there. He's got a dove. There's candles. It's 10 seconds. Listen, everybody. <laughs> Listen to me, okay? <laughs> Who does a Prince gimmick nowadays? Velveteen, Velveteen Dream. Okay. You find a guy like Velveteen Dream, fine. He can do a Prince gimmick. Just because the fucking guy's name is Prince Ikea doesn't mean it's a good name or a good idea to rename him the artist formerly known as Prince Ikea. It's a horrible idea. They chose the worst fucking guy on the roster to do this. Lash LaRue would have been better. Yeah. Tony Mamaluke would have been ten times better. They chose the artist formerly known as Prince Ikea. Clever. And just in case you don't get the joke, Tony says, that is the artist formerly known as Prince Ikea. Yeah. In case it went over your head in 1999. Kurt Hennig versus Larry Zbysko on TV in December of 1999. <laughs> the millennium is almost over. A decade after they were fighting over the world title. Larry is shirtless. He looks way better than Oklahoma. So the ref gets bumped. They great in the match, too. Yeah, they, had, they had a great record. Kurt Hennig and Larry Zbysko good at wrestling. Shocking news. Oh, the, my God. There's so much left on the show. Keep going. The ref gets bumped and is down for like an hour. Larry has a guillotine. Shane makes the save. Arn hits a baseball bat to Hennig and Shane, revives the ref, and Larry wins. Creative Control shows the video. The ref reverses the decision. Hennig wins by DQ. So Larry Z is gone. Larry Z's gone. Oh, man. Chris Benoit walks. The Outsiders walk with a ladder. Disco and Lash, I wrote Larry here, uh, having tarred and feathered Tony Marinara, now they put an apple in his mouth. The Italians, who are now nude, now they have a monitor. Now they see what's happened to Tony. They grab their clothing and go to save him. 
Chris Benoit versus Kevin Nash. All those segments were like five seconds each, by the way. Yep, yep. It took us longer to recap them. So we have been criticized by some for not pointing out when Bobby Heenan may be imbibing, drinking on the job. Criticized? Like, everyone is so outraged that, that he was drinking on the job. Like, do you fucking watch these shows? C- good for him! Yes. Congratulations, Bobby. You're the one smart guy in this whole fucking company. Yeah, said- There's no way you can do this job sober. So, as it, we, we were criticized for not pointing it out. There's no ignoring it on this one. They all were talking about it. Uh, he gets confused about which one's Hall and which one's Nash. He gets confused about what's the ladder match and who's in the one on the pay-per-view. They ask him, are you going to use this... Oh, you didn't need to be drunk to get confused about that. Are you gonna going to use this ladder Hall? And he says, you read, you read the format. You know what it is. Uh, so finally, they just ask him, what are you drinking? Can I have some? <laughs> so they had what was a very good match for Kevin Nash, a bad match for Chris Benoit. <laughs> I love Benoit matches, though, because, like, he's going to go in and have his match. It doesn't matter who you are. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter if you want to do it. Yep. <laughs> like, he's going to fucking have his match with I'm you. I'm going to chop you, Beat Kevin the Nash. shit out of Kevin Nash for a long time. Mm-hmm. And finally, Nash cut him off, and Benoit made a comeback, and just drop kicks the ladder right into Kevin Nash. Yeah. And... Does a crossbody off the ladder on the hall. Yep. He was fighting off both outsiders, and everyone's going crazy. Yep. There was... This was good. One of the very few things that Vince Russo did was have faith in guys like Chris Benoit and Booker T and promote them as stars. Yes. And he did that here. So eventually, uh, he gets cut off and Sid made the save and there was no finish. They were going to go for the edge onto a ladder, but Sid mm-hmm. made the save. Saved his life. Yeah. Is what Tony said. And then Bobby just goes, well, his back at least. <laughs> so whether he was drinking or not, he was on top of his game. Yeah. Two hours late, DDP arrives to the building. Yeah. The Italians have put their clothes on and are walking. Gene interviews Sting, who has nothing to say about Liz, says he's at least one step ahead of Lex at all times. He calls out the outsiders. Uh, The Italians go to the ring. They call out Disco and Lash, who desperately need a team name, by the way. Vito was a hell of a promo, actually. He's been great ever since he showed up on this show. He was a hell of a promo. And Johnny's a good Johnny the Bull. (laughs) He's a good lunkhead. Okay. He's a good lunkhead that stands in the back and... And is big. Yeah. Yeah, he's a good uh, big shirt, little hat guy. <laughs> you know? That's what he was here. I think he's a pretty little shirt he's wearing. So the twins from last week come out and they distract these men. Of course, Disco and Lash attack from behind. And more praise for Vito. He took this awesome bump for a Disco Inferno punch. Yeah, he's great. A Disco punched him and Vito bumps up like... like uh, Matt Bourne doing that whoopee cushion on Sunday night. Just straight up in the air. Back in the day, I was not a fan of Vito. It's like, fuck, there's Vito on TV again. But you know what? He's a pretty talented fucking guy. He's got a lot going Good for promo. him. Good he's, promo. He's been great in all of these segments. You can hate the segments. I don't need to see 45 fucking segments in the last two weeks with these guys. But as far as like a performer, he's really good. So Tony runs out. Tart and Feathered has a pipe. He's so upset by this Tart and Feathering that he's dancing like a chicken. And they lay out Disco and Lash. And well, now they've got their revenge. I see. They've got them. Mm-hmm. So now he's all, even though he's humiliated, it's a bunch of chicken jokes. Mm-hmm. I thought he was great. I love the Italians. They, they carry Disco and Lash away. Maestro is still on the hunt for Symphony. The Italians put their enemies in a limo. They're all happy. Then they realize they can't find the keys. And the car drives away because Disco and Lash just sold their car. Did you notice Tony Mamaluke just falling down? Yeah, I thought at first he was like trying to rub some of the molasses off his face in the limo, and then he just went to the earth, and they just carried him up. Really weird. And they kept on going. I recall he had a lot of concussions, too. Right. Yeah. A lot of them. That was scary. So, Maestro, here's the payoff. Three hours of the Maestro on the hunt trying to save his woman. We get some artsy-fartsy camera effects. He, He accidentally finds Jerry Flynn... And gets his ass kicked. He walked into the block. Mm-hmm. Big mistake. Just gets destroyed. Jerry Flynn kicks his ass while the fans chant boring. <laughs> and David Flair shows up and lays out Flynn with a crowbar. He's he lays Thank out Thank God with a crowbar. I waited the entire show for this shit. He has Symphony in a headlock. He's been dragging this woman around through the hallways to the basement to the block for hours. And he drags her away as she's screaming and begging for help. And Tony responds... David Flair still has Symphony. Folks, here's the Lugs boot of the week. Yeah. Yes. Nick Patrick bars a bunch of people from ringside. Liz has papers for Sting. They walk to the ring. They have passed by Sid and Vito, who are all just hanging out 
backstage because it's what you're doing. You're not on yeah, a camera. Sid's trying so hard not to be seen, <laughs> but he's Sid. You know what I mean? <laughs> he's not hiding. He's he's no. I, he was like like they start to walk by and Sid just goes. Yes, he stands up is very it? tall. Like, oh, maybe they won't see me right now. I'll he, put my arms down by he, my side. He thinks, They're a T Rex. If I don't move, they won't see me. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> what is that flesh colored pillar? <laughs> Dallas Page puts on his boots. Scott Hall versus Sting. Kevin Ash immediately interferes. Nick Patrick ejects him. Yeah, Nick Patrick said, you cannot be down there unless you have legal business at ringside. And Nash is doing commentary. I'm like, that's fucking legal business right there. He gets ejected. And then they had a fine match. And Liz sprays Mace in Hall's face, and Sting wins with the Scorpion. Yeah, Hall will do a job for anybody. He doesn't care. He's made his money. He's a star. Mm -hmm. He's not one of these weird-ass fuckers that has to win all the time or never lose. He knows it's fake. The best thing on the show by a mile. Flair is dragging, David Flair is dragging Symphony down the hallway. Tony asks, what does he have left to do here tonight? Bobby Heenan, there's a pause, and Heenan says, stuck! <laughs> I watched it like five times in a row. <laughs> Listen, if you had a problem with Heenan drinking, you got a problem with me. He needs to drink more. Yes. <laughs> Like, it's the most obvious thing in the world. What do you think he's got to do? He's a stalker. He's going to stalk this woman. It is absolutely incredible. I mean, it is unprofessional to drink on the job, but, like, this fucking job? Like, it still <laughs> like amazes he's the me only one. that all these years later, people are still appalled that Bobby was drinking on these fucking nitros. Don't forget the Christmas show in a couple weeks. I, I, I just can't. I don't even understand. Like, honest to God, like, more power to him. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck, this show's so bad. I want to drink. David Flair gives Maestro, comes out of the ring, says, Maestro, you have 10 seconds to come claim your bride. They're married now. The show is still going. DDP comes out instead. I guess Paige is a good guy now. He I don't know what he is. Lays, I, who he knows? doesn't trust anybody. He hits a diamond cutter on Flair, addresses a rumor that he wanted out of his contract, and he wanted out of his contract to go to the WWF. Because we must words. mention them by name every chance we get. So it talks about loyalty and doing the right thing, but lately people have not been loyal to him, so he's looking out for himself. DDP versus Sid. The announcers, well, they make an announcement at the pay-per-view. Creative Control and Kurt Hennig versus Harlem Heat and Midnight in an intergender six-person match for the tag team titles. <laughs> I hate the show. This fucking match, Sid took the funniest bump for a clothesline off the top. <laughs> he sat down. He sat down, rolled backwards. <laughs> he just sits down. Just horrible. The goddamn referee takes a bump. I was so over this How show when the ref took a bump. Is there a ref bump in every match on that show? I, I think on every fucking match there's been a ref bump. Sid, it's a power bomb. Nash and Hall hit the ring. Fans want Goldberg. Jarrett comes down. Bret Hart comes down. We get a six-way brawl. This is what happens, everybody. Are you ready for this? Nick Patrick then announces... Fuck all these guys. The main event tonight is a lumberjack match involving all of them. And the referees, we have seen enough, and we're going home. So all the referees go home. Mm -hmm. There's a lumberjack match with no referees. I'm like, what? So the individuals involved, they begin to all fight. Mm -hmm. The wrestlers and the lumberjacks. And why the fuck not? There's no referee. I'm trying to figure out how we're going to have a winner here. So they're all brawling. Like, okay, so when they're all brawling and there's no referee and suddenly Roddy Piper's music hit, I was like, that was good, okay? It has been, we know that he was hired to be a referee. Mm -hmm. And it would have been a lot better if they hadn't done that bullshit in the middle of the show with creative control. But like when they played his music, it was like, that's right. He's a referee. And he comes down, he lays down the law, and he gets this lumberjack match going with himself as a referee. Now, let's backtrack a second. What was Nick Patrick's plan? That'd he signed a lumberjack match and then sent all the referees, including himself, home. I guess that they all kill each other. <laughs> then why not just say, we're going home, you guys all fucking kill each other? Why did he make it a lumberjack? Why did he make a specific match with a specific fucking stipulation? But then, like, all the referees are going home. I don't know. <laughs> this is the fucking <laughs> stupidest thing. I don't know. This is just so <laughs> stupid. Why are we watching this? I don't know. 
So, yeah, when, uh, the point when Jared tries to flee, they had some football players there, although they weren't wearing jerseys. Who so the fuck were they? Some large men in street clothes. Thankfully, Tony knew exactly who they were. I knew the names, even 20 years later. So, uh, Dustin Rose throws Jared back in the ring. The bell rings to start the match. It's Jeff Jarrett versus Goldberg in a lumberjack match. And then this match starts, and I look at the thing and says, there are seven minutes still to go. No way. This is the point where I gave up on the show. Well, Brett hit the ring, hit Jarrett with the belt, Goldberg got his spear, Jackhammer Jeff Jarrett got the pin. I will say, I will say, I will give them credit. The fans were super into this because Goldberg was there, Roddy Piper was there, all the lumberjacks were brawling outside. It actually was exciting television. Yes. And and they loved it. They loved the finish. The babyface won. The babyfaces celebrated together, showing off the air. I mean, this is not the worst Nitro of all time. Oh, God, no. No. It's the best Nitro in like a month. It, it actually may be the best Russo Nitro yet. And that is low fucking praise, everybody. I, but, hey. I do have two things to add. Yes. Uh, first of all, Sid is a fantastic cheerleader. <laughs> when Sid's banging on the mat with both hands, and everyone's going crazy. He pump, turns around and pumps him up. Sid's great. Sid should have been like a manager and tag team guy his entire career. Just come out. He's 10 feet tall. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> I don't want to watch him wrestle. I want to watch him stand there and be scary and cut wacky promos and be intense and fire up the crowd. Second point here. Somewhere in all this madness and melee, Jeff Jarrett hit Bill Goldberg in the head with the chair. It was the loudest chair shot I've ever heard in my life. Oh. I thought, that sounded like a fucking gun. And Tony says, that sounded like a fucking gun. Yeah. And he may have cursed. So don't do that, everybody. Goldberg's grabbing his head the rest of the night. Somehow survived in one, but God, don't hit people in the head with chairs really fucking hard. That's the end of Nitro. I tried so hard to get through this quickly. <laughs> 50 minutes we spent on that Nitro. Well, let's do the finishes and go home. <sighs> this may take 50 more minutes. The finishes on this show were pin in an intergender hardcore match. Clean pin. Pin via betrayal in an intergender three-way. Vampiro gets pinned by a manager. Submission after distraction. No finish in a women's match. Submission in a handicap I quit match where the dude was his own ref. DQ due to run in. Pin after ref bump and interference and weapon shot. Reverse to a DQ and an announcer gets fired. No finish due to ref bump and ladder and interference with two men. Submission after interference and mace. No finish after ref bump and shit. Pin after way too much bullshit to get into here. Wow. Nice. Yes, Rob. Oh, no, I was, uh, I was just stretching my arm. Sorry. <laughs> Where's your hat? I have makeup. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God for Rob. Rob is, a, Rob is the best part of my whole day. I want you to know that. <laughs> Thank you, <dude. laughs> I apologize. I shouldn't have brought up the hat. Christ. I, I rant about how much these fucking shows suck, and then you're doing that to my show? Me? Not you, him. Oh. What did I do? It's not even his fault. You asked him a fucking question. How dare I? Yes, you know I got to turn him on. Well, do a little dance. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. WCW Monday Nitro 221, December 13th, 1999. It just starts in Jarrett and Benoit are fighting backstage. Hey, that was one of the rare good things on this show. Jarrett's winning on him, but then Benoit wins on him and whips him into a convenient cardboard box of Jenga over in the corner. <laughs> yeah. Boxes stacked up for no reason. Empty. Em- empty cardboard yeah, boxes. It's a, it's a wrestling show, so they got to have yes. like random fucking metal pipes just stacked up backstage that can just fall down and make a lot of noise. What are those fucking pipes for? Why would you need a bunch of random metal pipes backstage at an event? Exactly. Making a giant bong. Let's go. They, never mind. Go ahead. <laughs> the opening match here. Oh, do you know it was seven minutes? I did before these guys even I, fucking rang the dude, bell. Fucking the maestro's entrance. Yes. Okay. It's the artist formerly known as Prince Ikea, accompanied by Paisley, who is Charmel, not Paisley Alvare- Alvarez. Yeah. Right. Versus the maestro with Symphony. Yes. So Ikea just and he comes out and he's like, I don't. It still took forever. There's like well, there's shit falling from the ceiling. He's, he's got, got like purple, the music. Purple confetti. He takes his time. They, they, they did not. His music was like a blatant purple rain knockoff. So they have yes. re- replaced it with some strip club music. 
and he comes out of the purple confetti. He's not. He's he's trying to be Prince, but he can't do it. No, no Nobody shit. Can be prince. You're telling me Prince Ikea can't be Prince. So he's just like looking down on the ground, doing nothing. He has taken shoe polish and penciled in a goatee of some kind. Yeah. So the maestro comes down. The maestro's entrance is he plays piano on a platform that lowers from the ceiling as Symphony stands by him, but. They shoot this with a camera that is also mounted yes. on the platform. So for the first minute of this, I thought he was just out on stage. I thought, why does he stand up? Why does he play this goddamn piano? He has a match, right? He's resting here. And then he cut to a wider shot, and you see he's still descending. He's not yet hit the earth. The production value in this thing was amazing, and they couldn't even get it on camera right. Even he was like, this is taking two and a half hours. So the match finally starts, and Tony Schiavone says, We know extensively about both men. No, we don't. Fuck you. No. We know fuck all about the maestro. Lying. He showed up one day and started playing piano for some goddamn reason. I don't know a goddamn thing about Prince IK, except he had some matches and won a championship. I guess that's true. I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know anything about him. So the whole match... Is he Curtis IK's kid? I don't know. I mean, that's like the first thing they should tell us. But we, we don't know anything about the guy. So the women jump in the apron. They each slap the other guy. And... Maestro, uh, Prince pins the Maestro with a roll up holding the tights. Can we talk about Don't Maestro's hair? Prince. Don't call him Prince. It was the Prince before this. Maestro's, Maestro's hair is like, it's weird. <laughs> that, that's the weird part of this to you. <laughs> he needs. <laughs> it looks like a wig, he needs but it's not. I've never seen a hair do like this before. Uh, look at, find pictures of Neil Young and imagine it blonde. This is a terrible parody of pro wrestling. This, this is, is very bad. A Saturday Night Live skit about pro wrestling, very, making fun very of it bad. and burying it. And that was the point, because then Jared came out and killed both dudes with the guitars. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine spending seven minutes on two entrances just so Jared could come out and waffle both guys with a guitar? No. What a goddamn fucking waste of time. You know how much it probably cost to lower that piano from the ceiling? Not free. I can't even imagine. You know this company lost $62 million the next year? So Jarrett challenges Benoit to a bunkhouse brawl. I guess tonight. I wrote down a Starcade, but no, it's not tonight. tonight. They actually announced the card for the show. The announcers mm -hmm. ran down the card. They did. That's a that's a positive there. I absolutely. Right? Kevin Nash tells Scott Hall to come on. We yeah. never saw Scott. Medusa catches Evan flirting with Spice. Why Vi couldn't they show him? By the way, I don't know because if you remember, like a few weeks ago, Hall would say, "Come on, Kev," because Kevin would have some makeup on. Mm -hmm. So like okay. they were waiting, you know. To, to reveal him. For the Vince yeah. McMahon disguise. Nash goes, come on, Hall. Come on, Hall. And then, like, later we see Hall, and he's just Hall. I, I don't know. Hmm. Uh, Medusa beats or gets in a fight with Spice. They're fighting over Evan. Brett, Brett Hart gets a promo. He respects Bill Goldberg. Wants to give him a title shot. We, we're, we're jumping way ahead here. We First are? off, why does Brett have the world and the tag team titles? That's a... Well, it... <laughs> that is a good question. I didn't realize he had the world tag title until this thing was over. What? That's why I didn't write it he down. He showed up with it. Why was I not watching him come out? This I is one of the 78 segments here on this fucking show. <laughs> he had, I saw he had a belt. I figured it was just his world title belt. He no, two. he had two belts. He had the world yes. title and the tag title belt. When Goldberg came out and they both had belts, that's where I re put two and two together. I see. The announcers mentioned, we have new tag champions after Thunder. That's all they said. Okay. They didn't say who the champions were or what happened. This Evan Courageous thing with Spice. So Medusa. I was trying to get through the show in a hurry. Medusa's mad at Evan. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yes. Okay. Evan's flirting with Spice. Yeah. As he should. Medusa hates Evan, but she still wants to kick Spice's ass. That's her yes. man. Okay. You don't watch Raw? I do. The Nitro Girl stuff is worse than Baron Corbin. <laughs> okay. That's fucking saying something. Mm. Hmm. Then we have the Brett promo. Talks about his tag team partner, Goldberg. What? I... Can we have one fucking replay to tell us what happened on Thunder? So, and then the wolf pack comes out yep. and want their belts back. Yeah. Nash and his mock troll neck and giant oversized button-up shirt. Where the hell did Kevin Nash get a shirt that's four sizes too big for him? Destination XL. I guess. So, that's it. They're doing a tag match at the end of the show. Jean interviews Medusa and, as she, as she put it, her two big, beautiful blue eyes. He is leering at her breasts. This is like his new gimmick now. That is yeah. two weeks. That yeah. is an excellent description. He was leering. Yeah. And it's, it's not like he's looking in the eyes and occasionally peeking at her boobs. No. He's staring at her tits and occasionally peeking at her eyes. Yes. And it's the gimmick because she calls attention to it. Just like it was Molly. Or what the hell's her name? Mona. Yeah. Last week we did the same thing. Anyway, she's going to wrestle Spice tonight. Piper arrives. He cuts a promo on New Who Orleans. Who is this guy? 
I know who this guy is. There's some fellow there with Roddy. Oh, yeah, yeah. Fuck, what's his name? It's been driving me crazy all day. The same guy I was with him last week. I could have called Buddy. He'd have told me immediately. He's an old pro- Portland guy. Someone would know, I bet. What the hell's his name? Oh, Farmer probably knows. Farmer probably know? I'll, I'll remember it at some point, but like all day I've been trying to remember this guy's name. Yeah, Edmund Reddy's number? I'm not going to call him here on the show. Well, not now. Well, I, I, I could find out it's not that important. All I'm right. just pointing out that like we all know this name. All I right. will send a well-worded text. All right. Lex Luger arrives. The Red Rooster tells him he's teaming with David Flair against DDP and Sting. Everyone's texting somebody now. David Flair gets a package. Was it the bear? Did we ever find out what this package was? I presume it's the bear. Medusa versus Spice. So Medusa, as we've been discussing, has big fake boobs. And she comes out her for entrance. They're just bobbling all over the place. <laughs> I've never seen fake boobs move like this. So they might not be fake. I, maybe not. I, 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 Are we talking about Medusa? Yeah. They might not be fake. <laughs> <laughs> it's possible. No, it's not. You know, I'm thinking about a Lunder Blaze, Craig. I believe they were fake. I, I'm, 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 uh, you know what? I'm pretty You're right. sure. You're yeah. right. So, let's see. Evans in the ring. Medusa wants him to hit Spice. Spice hits them both from behind, and then she pins Medusa as they're lying in the ropes. Medusa is under the ropes. She gets pinned. Dude, her leg is draped over the rope. She still kicks out at three. <laughs> she wanted nothing to do with this. So, this finish of Spice p- pinning Medusa in the ropes is a build to Medusa versus Evan at Starcade. Yeah. What? And, hey... So, Medusa grabs Evan. She's acting like she's going to seduce him. But instead, she gives him a German suplex, right? Yes. So, what was she doing? She didn't even wrap around his waist. She, like, she like grabbed his waist like this. Yeah. And, like, pulled him over like that. It was the most effortless German what suplex I've ever seen. What the hell was that? I, I don't know. Why couldn't she give Evan Courageous, of all people, a real... It's not like she was giving it to Spice. I think it was to make it look like she was... Trying to uh, play nice with him. I mean, it didn't look bad. It didn't look bad, but... It was not the way you're supposed to German somebody. That's why I said it was the most effortless German you ever saw. It didn't look real. No. I tell right. you that much. All right. Russo, t- uh, Russo tells Rhonda Singh she needs an agent. He won't talk to her directly. We get a Revolution Hacksaw Duggan video package, and then out comes Hacksaw. And by this point, I was already so bored of this show. So- well, I hope you learned a lesson. Yeah, Hacksaw's awesome. Fucking Hacksaw. The Jim best Duggan's thing on this show promo. this week for sure. The best thing on this show in probably since Russo showed up. This is awesome. I'm not sure I've seen a better promo in WWE, WWF, or WCW this year. What have we seen that's better than this? He cut the most amazing, patriotic... He starts out baby face promo. He's very humble. He's lucky, he says, to have survived cancer just to live a little extra time with his daughters and his wife. And he's saying this like his eyes are moist. He, he's, he's touched. He's sincere about this. He, he was almost torn away from them. And every day with them is a new gift. And he appreciates that. And he's very humble about that. And then like a switch goes off. And when he talks about the revolution demeaning the good name of the USA and he's coming off his deathbed he will attack and attack and attack he's just amazing and the crowd's all behind him going crazy he saved the entire show and then the lights go out and there's a strobe and he's just laid out we don't know what happened yeah just fell asleep or something well there was a strobe light maybe he's epileptic and had a seizure (laughs) so backstage Russo brags about his remote control he's the one who turned the lights out Piper enters. Russo says, you will referee Kurt Hennig versus Buff Bagwell tonight, and I want you to do the right thing. Lex is looking for David Flair. Kurt Hennig versus Buff Bagwell with Roddy Piper as special ref. Buzz kills in the crowd. What in the fuck happened in this match? Can somebody help me? Well, Piper was supposed to be in favor of Kurt, but he also said in favor of Buff. He was counting slow whenever Kurt made a cover and fast whenever Buff made a cover. I just zoned out. <laughs> it was. I did right here. I'm so fucking bored. Yeah, so not the only one. I didn't even know what was happening. And uh, Buff at one point did a standing frog splash and landed on Kurt's knees. And finally, Piper just punches Hennig in the face and can't fast cancel for the win. Why couldn't he have done that at the beginning? Why didn't you do that five minutes? Goes what I wrote down. We're all on the same page here now. The weirdest fucking thing on the show. This is one I want you guys to explain to me if you know what happened. 
Lex find, finds David Flair's office. He opens the door. I guess he hears noises. We don't hear anything for a while. Yeah, we did. Eventually we did. Okay. At first it was silent. And then we heard noises, but I didn't even know what they were. It's David singing. He was singing a song. He, he's he doing his thing where he does the mankind deal. He rocks back and forth and sings. We've seen it for a couple of weeks. Lex made a bunch of really silly faces, and it faded to black. <laughs> yeah. David Flair's a wild man. How is he so much better as a wild man than he was... He's not. He sucks. He's better than he was being uh, he's way Ric more, Flair Jr. He's got some charisma now. He does. Yeah. He's a guy pretending to be crazy. Which is better than a guy pretending to be Ric Flair. Okay, let's go back to having him being a big dumb stiff. Jared has a bin of plunder. Benoit has a ladder. Did you not watch his match on this show? I wasn't where talking he was about a his giant match. stiff. I wasn't talking about his match. Jeff Jarrett versus Chris Benoit in a bunkhouse brawl. I love this match. This was good. I watched this many times when I was a youngster. Chris Benoit, this guy could wrestle, he could fly, he could sell, and he could fucking brawl. Amen. He had a hardcore match here that was better than like 99% of the hardcore matches you ever saw in ECW. Yep. It was incredible. I could have done without seeing him choke Jarrett with a rope, and then he didn't say we might see a hanging. Well, it was it was actually... What are you going to do? Benoit's on the ladder... I thought that was the very beginning I'm talking about. There's another one where Benoit's on the ladder, and Jarrett tries to lasso him, mm-hmm. but he doesn't quite make it, so Benoit has to put the rope around his own yes. neck. Oh, yeah, yeah. And yeah. right when I wrote it down, I thought, that's uh, not funny. No, delete, 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 delete. Yeah. So Dustin Rhodes gets involved. He attacks Jarrett. The ref tries to save Jarrett. Uh, this lets... Oh, what the fuck happened? Jarrett throws... Dustin into the ladder. Mm-hmm. Benoit's on top of the ladder. He takes a mighty splat to the mat. And then Jared just pinned him. Lex, David, and a headless teddy bear had a chat. Lex Luger wants to discuss strategy he does. with David Flair. Right. St- Who's going to start? Who's going to start? Yeah. I got an idea, Lex. You. You and then don't tag out. You are a multi time world champion. Your partner sucks. <laughs> A Porsche arrives at the building. Everyone write down whatever time it is, wherever you are, write down what time it is. Just think about a Porsche has just arrived at the building. Yes. I like where you're going with this, Vince. (laughs) Piper has a bat. He's fighting off Russo's crew in the office until Hennig lays him out with a chair. The best thing on this show. (laughs) Fucking Tank Abbott and Ming. I I, I remember Tank Abbott coming back because he, like, knifed a guy at a pay-per-view or something. (laughs) Yeah, Big Al. Big Al. Tank, Abbott, and Meng? Are you kidding? Could- well, I was really excited until it went one minute, and they it was both the got best, blown up. It was the best one-minute double count-out ever. They did clubber each other. It was the, oh, the, yeah. All it was was two minutes of intense, dirty boxing, and it was awesome. <laughs> but you know what, Vinny? It was like nobody gave a shit in the crowd. I did. The only people that cared are you and me and the guys in the back. I don't know what I care about. The fans are just dead. Tank is totally fucking blown up. It is amazing. The whole point of bringing Tank Abbott in is that he has a name that he established elsewhere. So they do zero hype videos. None. They do zero teases. They do zero zero announcements. Tank Abbott just walks out like a guy. Yeah. So they they, they had an intense brawl. It was very, very brief. That is for the best. And they countered out and brawled to the back. And everyone booed. Mm -hmm. I'll acknowledge everyone booed when they both got countered out. Okay, remember the Porsche? Yeah. That pulled up in the building that was parked? Right. We go back to it. Canyon has been sitting in the front seat of that Porsche for 20 minutes. Just sitting there. Well, he was in there with two ladies. No, they walked up. They were waiting for him. Oh, he was okay. in there with his lawyer or his agent or whoever, okay. whoever Clarence Mason was. That's even to weird. Be. Now, so if you're in a limo, they're roomy, they're spacious, there's liquor. Why are you hanging out on your porch just sitting there for 20 minutes? So it's cha- it's a Champagne Canyon now. And he has Clarence Mason. He meets up with some women. He walks inside. And apparently he's a pimp. He's, he's, no, he's a Hollywood star. He's got money. Yeah. Well, the dressed, women flock. He's to dressed him. like the Godfather. He, he well, when you're when you're a star, you wear a hat with a feather in it. Yeah, I see. Whether you be a pimp or an actor, I got to get me a hat. or a dandy or a dandy. This is uh, right after. Maybe it's to... macaroni in his hat. A Yankee Doodle. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this wow. is right after Ready to Rumble. So he actually had been in Hollywood making a movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you guys realize that he was making Ready to Rumble? Yeah, we do. Yes. Okay, no one else yeah, fucking nobody else did. did. No. This fucking guy just shows up out of Hollywood. Yeah. I don't think one time during the show did they mention Ready to Rumble. Nope. Or he was the... They did say he had been in Hollywood, but didn't say why. Yeah, he was Oliver Platt's stuntman. Yeah. Remember how fat Oliver Platt was? <laughs> yes. And this skinny guy's a stuntman? And he's like 6'5", and yeah. I don't think Oliver Platt is. What the fuck? Well, Mark that... Sawyer! 
Oh! That was Piper's, his uh, lackey. Bart Sawyer? Yep, Bart Sawyer. It would make sense. Yep. Huh. Yep. I, I, I knew I recognized him. Yeah. I, I remember Bart having the, like the spiky hair, but it was, he'd grown out here in the late 90s. Mm. So, security tells Roddy Piper not to use a fire extinguisher. Ming and Tank are still brawling backstage, and they're, <laughs> they're still just, uh, just throwing punches. And the announcer says, this is the damnedest thing I've ever seen. And it's so damnedest, they just cut away in the middle of it. Yep. Instead of letting us keep watching it. No, it's not there. They're not the production crew. No, I know. They were very excited, but these other idiots cut away. Yeah, I'm, I'm out of the guys who cut away. Revolution comes out to cut a promo against America. See, America's divided along racial, religious lines. It's good to know something's never changed. I have so many questions. So, Dean's cutting this promo, and he says, we got heat. And Perry says, yeah, the guys in the back don't like us. And Dean says, no, we got Harlem heat. And Harlem heat comes out. I bet they thought that was a really funny line. Of course yeah. they did. Harlem Heat and Midnight versus Dean Malenko, Perry Saturn, and Asia. I wrote, Revolution wins. That's how into this fucking match I was. Did okay. I miss anything? Uh, yeah, you missed something huge. The screen goes black. It's Midnight's For entrance. Midnight. Yeah. They come back on. Dean is on the ground, and Perry's on top of him, raining down punches. Yes. Nobody said a thing. No, and it led to nothing. Why did this happen? The only thing I can figure is that Saturn's new gimmick is that he's dumb. I think the gimmick is that, like... <laughs> and so he thought Dean Malenko was like Stevie Ray. Yeah, the lights That's went out. That's kind of what I thought, too. Someone tapped him on the shoulder, and then they threw Malenko he, in there, and he turned around and started pummeling the guy. Lights come back on, and it's Dean. If that was the thing, why didn't anybody say anything? Who gives a shit? Because they're not paying attention either. Shane was doing commentary. They're Shane, drinking. Shane's been doing commentary in every match. He's awesome. Let's see. Saturn wipes out Asia. Stevie Ray makes a horrendous comeback. Midnight hurts her knee. And Dean pins Stevie with a roll-up. A complete disaster, I noted. Mike Tanay interviews Lex and David. Luger's a level-headed one here. <laughs> Says the injunction has been filed. Liz will be with him tonight, not Sting. Yeah. Ah. Write that down. Okay. So in the middle of this, they cut away, and Piper's just swinging a chair and screaming. I hey, said they cut away. They pan over. He challenged somebody to a chairs match tonight. He did. A fucking chairs match. Wow. I, all I heard was random screaming sounds. Yep, Got yep, yep, yep. Them. The legendary chairs match of TLC fame <laughs> actually stems back to Roddy Piper doing it on Nitro in something that some fucking writer as a kid probably thought was so cool, and they're doing this shit still today. Rhonda Singh wants Clarence Mason to be her agent. He says no. Travo tries to sell her some stuff. And he does. Ming and Tank, Tank are just having the best fucking battle of all time in the back. They're up against one of those big steel doors, and they're just throwing punches at the doors. It's making this big noise. You can see the ripples in the door going up and down, and they're screaming and hollering and punching. It's the best thing ever. It's Godzilla and Kong backstage at Nitro, and it's awesome. It's just great. <laughs> Paul Orndorff says, shows up. Says hi to Mike Graham. Says, I'm here to meet the powers that be. Mike is sad to hear this, but says they're down there. Whatever is left of the Nitro Girls are doing a dance. Oh, now they're fucking dancing again? Yeah. We got the three remaining Nitro Girls dancing. They haven't been on in weeks. Yeah, they haven't uh, fucking longer than that. I don't think they've been on since, like, September. W weeks could be num number of and weeks. And they, they're out there doing this fucking dance. Ronda Singh shows up. <laughs> Twelve weeks is weeks. <laughs> yeah, this is this is their attempt to build up those ratings. Eighty weeks can be. Ron is saying dances and beats them all up. This is the worst show ever. I wrote. We cut. We cut straight from Rhonda Singh interrupting the Nitro Girls to Fit Finley training Brian Nobbs in a river. <laughs> I still have no fucking idea what's going on. I have no idea what's going what on. What I got out of this was Fit Finley wants Brian Nobbs to do sit-ups so he'll be more prepared to do hardcore wrestling matches. <laughs> the did. last time we saw these guys, Finley beat him and cut his mullet off. Yes. And now suddenly he's training him. I still don't know what's going on. He made him do sit-ups. This doesn't make any sense. He was doing sit-ups in the river. Yeah. <laughs> I hate this shit. Not, not, not like with the flow of the stream, so you no. get an assist going up. No. Just like sideways, across the, across the, uh, the flow. <laughs> Norman Smiley has a full football uniform on. He goes into the block to fight Jerry Flynn. Why is it when they go to the block, there's now wacky video effects every week? My best guess is they are trying to make it actually look like Mortal Kombat. Except Mortal Kombat looked better than this, even in 1999. I can't wait till the blood graphics come in. <laughs> so, May and Tank are still brawling. They brawl into the block on accident. Oops. Everyone looks at each other, and they just trade dance partners like a big square dance. 
So Mang's brawling with Jerry Flynn, or uh, excuse me, Tank. Tank is brawling with Jerry Flynn, and Mang just starts chasing Norman through the building. <sighs> Orndorff meets with Russo. All right, this was great. So what? Rusev says, or Russo says, I hear you were training midnight. And Paul Orndorff is very proud. Why? Yes, I did. Why? She's a great athlete. So, Russo says, well, you're fired. And Paul Orndorff says, you're firing me because I did a good job training her? He says, I've been in this business 23 years. I've sold out more buildings than everybody else in this room. Kiss my ass, he says. Fucking Paul Orndorff was awesome. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wait till then later. they beat his ass. They beat his ass. He was so good here. Yeah. Goldberg's watching TV backstage. Probably a very important episode of Ally McBeal he was Poor watching. Poor fucker I wrote, because they said he was watching Nitro. <laughs> they flat out said he was watching the show. That's why he was never smiling. <laughs> <laughs> Sid is cutting a promo with a special needs young man named Seth, who is his... Sid's a big brother now. Yeah. To okay. Seth. And uh, he's got a match with Steve Williams tonight and Kevin Nash at the pay-per-view, and he cuts a promo on both of them. Yeah, he's got a power bomb challenge with Dr. Death tonight. That's what they say. Yeah. Then Oklahoma comes out and says, it is now a suplex versus power bomb match. (laughs) That's what he said. Yeah. (laughs) Can we ever just have a fucking wrestling match? Just one-on-one. But then when we do, I'm bored. (laughs) That's what they've done. They've conditioned you. They've conditioned you that every match. Here's the thing. You know that none of these matches matter. No. So you already don't care. Mm -hmm. Okay. The other problem is you presume every match is going to end in like 15 seconds with bullshit. Mm -hmm. And so you give up. Yeah. Immediately. And the next thing you know, it's been going on for like 12 minutes. You're like, why isn't this over yet? It is a self-fulfilling prophecy. This bullshit fucking nightmare here. Oklahoma's there. Vampiro's there. U-D-D-E-S. We're all over. I don't even know what I was trying to write there. All I know is Sid is in a powerbomb match of the paper with Kevin Nash, and he needs help to beat Dr. Death in a powerbomb match. Christ, I fucking hate this show. What'd I miss? I will just I will just add that Dr. Death and Sid is a good combo, because Sid Sid's offense is horrific. His, yeah. His selling is also bad, but it's better. And Doc is one of the few guys whose offense is, he's big enough, and his offense is good enough that it's believable. Dr. Death beating up Sid is one of the, some of the best wrestling we'll see in a Sid match. And he's also a big, just strong giant. He never got a suplex, but he's slamming Sid and throwing, throwing him around just with ease. Anyway. I love that a slam isn't a suplex. Not, I mean, it's not, but I mean, this is dumb. I know. Fuck. Either way, you end up on your back, so. Sid is checked for a concussion backstage as Seth looks on. Potential neck injury. Yeah. Outsiders cut a promo. It was short. Got at the point. Left. Lex Luger and David Flair versus Sting and Diamond Dallas Page. Tony Schiavone said, quote, This match, the fact that the total package and David Flair are going to be a team, is a train wreck waiting to happen. All I know is Flair, or not Flair, DDP and Sting come out together. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, so DDP is a baby face. But then... I don't know. DDP and Sting attack each other. Mm-hmm. Luger is standing in the corner holding David's stuffed animal, which no longer has a head. Yes. That was very nice of him. Luger hits Sting with a crowbar. Liz hits the ring to get the crowbar. Luger goes after her. David hits Luger with the crowbar. Sting makes the save. Did someone pin somebody here? Liz put Sting on top of Lex. Yes. There were kind of three. Mm. Most of this match was Sting fighting Paige, who was in fact his tag team partner. How in the fuck could anybody care about any of this? I have no idea. It it, it was the opposite of caring. It, it drove me away. This is one of the points where I had to turn this off and go take a break. Go do some chores. Do some manual labor. Get my mind off this. Uh, bullshit, I wrote. What pointless bullshit? Mang hunts for Norman. <laughs> Champagne Canyon's cutting a promo when Rhonda sang interrupts. Clarence tells security to get rid of her. Bam Bam Bigelow is happy to see his old friend Canyon, but Canyon jumps him and lays him out. Brett puts his boots on. Now, in fairness, they did go to commercial at this point. But I'm watching this show, and Canyon's putting the boots 
to Bam Bam. Brett puts his boots on, and then 20 seconds later, Bam Bam Bigelow is coming down the ramp for a promo. Yeah. <laughs> Calls out Canyon. Canyon is now Champagne Chris Canyon. Mm-hmm. He's got the clothes, the women, the Porsche, and fucking morgue music. Yes, he still has the, the morgue music. You couldn't get him a new fucking theme? God damn it. He's coming out here to this fucking music. The, the scary pipe There's organ. There's like a xylophone or something. There's not a xylophone. Whatever the fuck they're using in this thing. The pipe organ's not at all like a xylophone. Pipe organ. Yeah, and he comes out here like he's from fucking Hollywood. Now, I don't want to alarm you. Nobody gave a shit about this match. No, not nobody even gave a little. two shits about it. Canyon wins the flatliner out of nowhere. You can't even build up the Jersey crew breaking up and having a feud. Really? The flatliner is now called a rap. That's a rap. That's a rap. I see. Yeah. But they couldn't get him new music. <laughs> yeah. Ming finds Norman's clothes. Norman's hiding behind a pillar. He's doing the Hansel and Gretel thing. He's leaving a trail to put Ming off the scent. Valid. Yeah. Norman's one of the smarter guys in the show. Apparently. The Italians are carrying a body bag backstage. They say, with a camera on them, we're going to kill our opponents and leave their bodies at the river. Yes. <laughs> this seems like an easy case to crack for the local law enforcement. Piper cuts a promo on his torn bicep and his chair. Lash LaRue versus Big Vito in a body bag match. Lash LaRue, the local town hero. He was I sweet. literally zoned out. I, I'm trying so hard to pay attention to this match, and I just can't. It's not good. So this storyline involves two big, scary mobsters who have repeatedly made specific literal threats to kill Disco Inferno. Yes. Disco's out there with his big, red, sparkly cowboy hat. Mm-hmm. Oh. Doesn't care. I remember now. They have a match where you got to put a guy in a body bag. Right. All right. So Lash takes out Big Vito. Hits his move. He unzips the body bag. He rolls Big Vito into the body bag. To me, he's won. But Nick fucking motherfucking Patrick demands he zip this fucking body bag up. Lash is trying so hard to zip this body bag up. I timed it. He's zipping and he's zipping and it's fucking stuck. And Patrick's standing there and he's zipping. Time stands still. I'm like, my life is just passing away in front of me right now. And finally... He doesn't even get it all the way zipped up and this motherfucker rings the bell. No. Fuck you, Patrick. <laughs> Vito's Fuck head this is, show. Vito's head is still sticking God out. God damn it. From the moment Lash grabbed the body bag to the point where Nick Patrick rang the bell to end the match, 55 ah! seconds. Almost a full minute of just Lash fucking with a zipper. So then, of course, Vito's fine. This is not funny, everybody. No. It's not entertaining. No. All you shitheads on Twitter that have to go, oh, I'd much rather watch Nitro than Raw because Nitro was at least funny. It wasn't uh, funny. No. There's nothing funny about this show. So Vito took us a severe beating that he escapes the body bag. They beat up Lash. They throw in a bag. Of course, they zip it up in seconds. Which You put the heat on Nick Patrick. I put the heat on Lash. Lash could not get this fucking body bag to work. The Italians made it look really easy. They carry him away, and the announcers are very casual, saying, well, they're going to take Lash away, they're going to throw him into a river, and they're going to kill him. In the parking lot, the Italians forget where they parked the car. They set the body bag down. They go away. Idiots. Paul Orndorff versus Creative Control. Paul Orndorff, long retired, with one arm, one of the best guys in the entire program. Just look great. Awesome out there. One of the rare good things on this show. He hit the pile driver. Arn and Larry are out there to interfere and distract, and Arn, or Orndorf wins with the pile driver. So apparently, uh, Orndorf was there, but Piper or uh, uh, Arn and Larry have been fired and are just flying themselves around the country. Yeah, they just go wherever and hmm. run in. And then Slick Johnson runs out and reverses the decision. Yeah, Larry and Anderson come out and they hit the ring. This is not a DQ. Why is it not a DQ? I have no idea. Orndorf hits a pile driver. Slick Johnson reverses it. Why was it originally not a DQ? Do we have, like, babyface and heel refs now? And, like, the babyface refs are are trying to save the company from creative control and, and Russo? Why doesn't he fire them? Actually, the heel ref for creative control debuted tonight on the show. Who, Slick Johnson? Bald-headed guy? Yes. Yeah, he's been around for years. Yeah, he's going to be the, the uh, creative Great. control's guy. I can't wait. 
The outsiders talk. I hear zero words. Piper swings a chair. The Italians find Norman Smiley in their body bag. Kurt Hennig versus Roddy Piper in a chair match. It goes one minute. Kurt just leaves. Yeah, that's... No, he didn't. He got hit with a chair shot and got knocked out outside. And he left. No, he was knocked out. He was dead. He got up and walked away. Well, later, but I mean, that's... <laughs> Piper was the winner. Yes. Okay. Because he knocked out Hennig with a chair. And the ref was counting. One, two, three, and, and Kurt does this thing, and he walks to the back. Does this thing? This thing. That's good radio. We have, we have video now. We have oh, a video right. camera. We have two, three, did this four. Thing. <laughs> Your impression of me is funny. <laughs> Bret Hart has been laid out backstage. Hey, let's be uh, let's be honest here. The fans loved Hennig versus Piper. Sure. The they, one thing they cared about on the show. They were very into Roddy Piper. Really, everything Piper did. Oh, now we get the best thing on the show. Today's backstage, and he goes, "My God, Bret Hart's down. We need paramedics." The camera rushes around the corner. Brett's not ready. He's on his feet. That's right. As soon as the camera rushes around the corner, he leaps and lays on the couch. <laughs> you didn't see this? I need to go back. It I mean, was so I need to go amazing. back and check good. this. I laughed my I, ass off. I did. I saw him on the couch, and I thought that's the best they could do is put him on the no, couch. No, he wasn't on the couch. He that's was standing the... there getting ready, and all of a sudden the camera whips around the corner too fast, and he fucking takes a bump <laughs> onto the couch and starts selling. It's not the best they could do. It's the best he could do in the situation. I need to load that up right now. It was so good. You guys talk about the match. I'm loading that up. All right, we have Goldberg versus Hall and Nash. So there's no Bret Hart. Goldberg wrestles him for a while, and then Bret comes down to the ring. He hits the ring, runs wild on the heels, goes for the sharpshooter on Nash. Hall breaks it up. Hall goes after Nash. Goldberg sets up for the spear on Scott Hall. Apparently, Kevin Nash was supposed to hit Bret Hart with the belt, but he missed. Bret did not sell it. So somehow... Brett just falls down holding his knee. Mm-hmm. Goldberg goes for the jackhammer, but as he's going for the jackhammer, the ref counts three. Nash pins Brett. I have no idea why all four fucking men were legal. Okay, here's today. Camera's turned in the corner. There's Goldberg's a stand. Ha <laughs> 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 Okay, everyone on Twitter, that was funny. One thing on this show was funny. What's the timestamp on that? Two hours, three minutes, and 34 seconds. The camera zooms around the corner. There's Mike Tanay. Goldberg's also standing there. Yes. He's in the room. I want slow-mo on this. The camera turns left. (laughs) Brett's sitting (laughs) down. Brett sits down, and he grabs his heart. (laughs) <laughs> yeah it's amazing <laughs> how hard is this I have no idea that was the one funny thing on the show oh, God. he's gonna have a heart attack you didn't laugh this hard when we went to the comedy show. I know we need the paramedics now <laughs> <laughs> okay alright so anyway somehow in here Hall and Nash become the new tag team champions yes what Oh, who cares? Fans pelt the ring with garbage. They did. And that is the build for Goldberg versus Bret Hart for the title oh on God. Sunday. Sadly, the beginning of the end of Bret's wrestling career. Oh, After so... that, his highlight in WCW. <laughs> I'm so happy you pointed that out to me. <laughs> These fucking idiots. <laughs> it's amazing. Absolutely amazing. <sighs> it's Nitro, everybody. You know what? I bet, spoiler alert, everyone. Brett turns out to be in on it. He's in cahoots. Probably is in The cahoots. Outsiders. I think he is. Yeah, that's the story. So I bet they wanted this so we notice and think, hey, Brett's faking. Oh, I see. Yeah. I don't think so. Oh. I think they're incompetent. Or they're just incompetent video. fools who are terrible at their jobs. Yes. Incompetence is, uh, is the more likely answer. Mm-hmm. Never assume, assume malice when simple incompetence will explain things. So anyway, that is the show, everyone. Oh, sweet mother of God. What a terrible program. Oh, your music. Oh, uh, who cares? Do we have to? Yep. This may take you four hours to get through this. The finishes on this show were pin with a handful of tights after interference by two women, pin in the ropes, like right in the ropes, after a guy was in the ring, pin when a crooked ref punches a guy and fast counts him, pin in a bunkhouse match after tons of interference, clean pin in an intergender trios match, win via power bomb after interference by vampi- vampires and cowboys. Pin between two teams where each guy hated his partner and chairs and crow balls. Crow, crow balls. Crow fuck. And U-D-D-E-S. <laughs> and U-D-D-E-S were involved. <laughs> Clean pin. Lord knows what the fuck that was. 
Win in a body bag match where the body bag was not zipped up all the way. Pinfall after a copious interference in a handicap match. And then DQ after copious interference in a handicap match. Count out in a chair match. We've got to do this fucking show twice for this song. <laughs> Bullshit pin in a tag match. Wow. When do we go to two hours? It's like two weeks. This may save my life. <laughs> I'm telling you. Like, <laughs> I don't know if I can survive. No, it's, it's like two weeks from now. And one of them, I think, is a replay or a best of or something like that. A best of. Yep. Can you fucking imagine it's the best for, of? It's just Tank and Mang. Jesus Christ. Yeah, bad shows, everybody. They're wretched. Don't watch them. No, absolutely. Cancel your network. It's not worth it. Hey, listen. You may, if you have the network, you may find yourself hitting the wrong button and accidentally watch these shows. All you idiots To avoid that Twitter, risk. I'll tell all you idiots Cancel the network this. and throw it at your laptop. That Bret Hart thing was funny. Yes. If it were three hours of that, I'd love this show. <laughs> it's not. Just Brad Falls. We get one funny thing in three fucking hours. The viewer's the one doing the Pratt Fall. It's not enough. It's true. All right, we're out of here, everybody. We are at war. I to work this way. I said, dude, I have no idea. I mean, I th- never touched any of that this stuff. This is why we have a producer. Yes. I couldn't run this computer if I had to. All right. I don't know what's going on. All right, let's do this Nitro show. WCW Monday Nitro number 222, also December 20th, 1999. I can't figure out how much I hated this show. There was stuff to like. There was stuff that changed your life I feel, in a good way. Well, that's true. I'm kind of numb to it now. I think I liked it better than recent shows, but there was stuff that was definitely stupider. I mean, that's for sure. The recap... Now, hold on. I want, oh. I want to make something clear as we do this review. Yeah. I want to review the show as we watched it. And, like, we can explain some shit a little bit later on. You know what I'm saying? Okay. So, the point of this is, the show opens up with a recap of Bret Hart versus Goldberg from Starcade that literally doesn't explain anything that happens. It doesn't even tell us who the champion is now, who won. All we know is there was a match, and Piper did something. This is a very, very poor recap. Like, the least you can do is tell us what happened, and then during the show, you can explain why it happened. The show opened, I didn't have any idea what happened. I was, was I smartened up soon, however. I was able to get out of this video package... That they just ripped off the Montreal finish. There was a Montreal screw job. Two years later. Yep. And somehow I didn't know that Brett was still champion. I don't know how you got that. I, I somehow. That's a, and, and Piper was there. Well, did you figure out why Medusa came out with Spice? No. Because I read The Observer for the show. I still don't know why Medusa came out with Spice. That was explained later. It was? It was. It was. <laughs> Thank but, God you're here. <clears throat> but it should have been explained before they came out. Another thing. Well, last, what was it? They both conspired to get the belt off of Evan Courageous at Starkey. <laughs> okay, <laughs> why? I have no idea. The now, what does Spice have to do with anything? Now they're just friends. The other thing. Last week we actually were very impressed because they had a rundown of all the matches that were going to be on this show. They didn't. And this we week. said that's a great idea. They should keep doing that. And this week. They didn't. Medusa, at the pay-per-view, became the first woman to ever become WCW Cruiserweight Champion. Mm-hmm. So Russo is just stealing his own ideas from the other company. Yep. She's, she's now China. And how did she mark this occasion? How did she note the significance of her historic championship win? Was it wearing her belt to the ring, Vince? I was going to say the, her, her dialogue. Yeah, she didn't wear the belt to the ring. I didn't right? see the belt anywhere. Uh, I just want to know that she she talked about her athletic achievement by saying, quote, women are dominating WCW with a little bit of TNA, and then she jiggled her boobs. Yes. <laughs> Women's evolution, baby. Yes. <laughs> so Buzz kills out there for whatever reason. She challenges into, ha- challenges into a match, and they fight. What a match. Medusa versus Buzzkill. Medusa is the first ever woman to win the Cruiserweight title. So how do they celebrate this fact? They put her in the ring with a total jobber named Buzzkill, who beats the holy hell out of her, and has the match won, but Spice has taken the referee. Yes. Are you absolutely kidding me? <laughs> that really happened. Spice throws a chain in for Medusa. She knocks out Buzzkill. She Germans him. She pins him. This was supposed to be, like, landmark for women? Yeah. This was supposed to be, like, something that we're supposed to get behind her for? Yes. <laughs> Dude. Tony promises a landmark Nitro. And then I wrote here, they run down the card. 
Well, they did mention that Bret Hart was WCW champion. Right. So it, we did get Maybe it. I went back and out of that. Yeah, I think mm-hmm. so. Russo is backstage. He tells his crew to be ready. That goof, Hugh Morris, is back. He books Kurt Hennig versus Hugh Morris. He wants it to be Hugh Morris' last match, and he wants Roddy Piper brought to him. He wants Kurt to end the career of Hugh Morris. Yes. Okay, just want you to remember that. Piper and his lackey show up. <laughs> it's it's Piper, his <laughs> lackey, and his child. La- last week we thought this was Bart Sawyer. It is Bart Sawyer. Well, Pi- they Bar- used his real name. His name is Steve. Yes. Yeah, Piper calls him Steve yes. all over the show. But his, his, re- his real name is Steve, and all it's right. Bart Sawyer. I see. So he's there with his son, and they're getting out of the limo. It was like nine. And the first thing he says nine. is... It's like six. Six, whatever. Did you go potty? Did your mom feed you? I laugh. This is like one of those things. How That's real fucking dialogue. ironic. <laughs> the week I, tra- I potty train Paisley, Roddy Piper gets out of the limo and goes, did you go potty? How many times I've asked that question this week? Do you need to use the potty? Like 5,000 times. I've never heard it on a wrestling show. In 30-something <laughs> years. I believe you. <laughs> and this is the week that I finally hear it for the first time? It's uncanny. So, uh, Creative Control t- tells Piper to come see Russo. Piper tells Steve to watch his kid. And then he brings the kid with him anyway. Well, I don't know if Steve was there. Steve was, like, carrying his bags or something. I see. Because Piper goes, I need to find someone to watch the kid. Mm-hmm. And Creative Control just goes, leave him there! Piper says, clearly you're not parents. And he takes his son with him. Yeah. What if he needs a potty? Kurt Hennig versus Hugh Morris. Cursed in his entrance, and they cut backstage where the Scream Killer has apparently murdered Shane. Okay, seriously, was this really the Scream mask? Because it looked like the Predator mask. I, I, I didn't Scream cap it. I saw a figure all in black with like a white ghostly fi- image It was supposed face. to be Scream, but anyway. They're doing this match, and a billionaire Ted oh, comes God. out. Oh, God. Oh, God. Hugh Morris' dad, who's escaped, I guess, from I don't even know what. He's Hugh Morris gown. has a sick old father. Yes. Who he brought to the arena in his... <laughs> Why? In his hospital gown. Yeah. Or he escaped. Well, I'm not sure if he brought him or if he escaped. But he escaped. Hugh's so unconcerned, he just tells dad, go back and wait for a few minutes. Sure, yeah. This goes on for, like, five minutes. Yeah, they can't just do the joke once. No. They gotta do it multiple times. Because you're dumb. Just like on Raw. So eventually, after more time spent on the crazy old man in the wrestling match, Kurt wins with the Hennig Plex. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think he's going to end Hugh Morris' career with that Hennig Plex. I mean, it might just be me. So Piper meets with Russo. They made some kind of deal. But now Russo wants Piper to go tell the people that he sold out. Russo says, I will never fess up to anything. You will take my heat. That is that is what he said. Does he know he's on camera on his own show? Well, the funny thing was... The funny thing was, I guess that we're supposed to think that we can see this and that nobody else can. I don't know why. <laughs> I have no idea why we were supposed to be thinking that. But point of this is, he says, Piper, you got to take the heat from me. I'll never admit I was wrong. That was a good one. And then Piper goes into this soliloquy. Now, Before the key here, begin, Vinny, the key right. here is as he's doing the soliloquy, you can hear the fans reacting to everything that he says. <laughs> so it's yeah. patently obvious that everybody can hear Russo. As he says, you need to go out there and take the heat because I'll never admit that I was wrong. And it's 2018 and he still hasn't. Now, before we get into the details of Piper's rant... Oh, I wrote it down. I just want to point out that we watched the Hogan-Piper rivalry show on uh, Sunday. Piper claimed that as a young man, he was the fifth in the world in the World Bagpipes Championships. See if that fits in with the story he tells here. So Roddy Piper says he's going to shoot with Russo, the Smarks, and the Marks. Starts screaming about his sport... He claims, I slept on the street at 13 years old while cars drove by filled with guys looking for a little boy to prey upon. But I never got in those cars. I had morality. I had God on my side. 
He claims he was the youngest wrestler ever at age 15. First off, I mean, whatever. He has 8,000 matches under his belt. He's the smartest of them all. Says, I set you up, Russo, you filthy-looking drag queen. Says, I love the fans. They saved my life. I've never sold out until I made a stupid deal with you. I'm going to go out there. I'm going to show my son how to be a man. Then I'm going to put him in the car. I'm going to turn up the heat. I'm like, what? It's cold out. Get a microwave in December. Going to have two security guys out there. And then I'm going to go shoot with Russo and his two condom-headed geeks. Everyone goes, ha, ha, condom-headed geeks. (laughs) What was he talking about there, by the way? They're bald. bald. I know, but he he shot on him again? Was there another promo I forgot? I guess there kind of was. But anyway, he had a lot of passion. (laughs) <laughs> I guess so. He's a also. weird dude. He's out of his goddamn also, mind. Yeah, but you know what? He was, he was the most compelling character on this program. That's That's fair. not saying much. Then we go to Tony Schiavone. Tony Schiavone is here to explain the Montreal screw job. <laughs> he says, for those of you that don't know. Who doesn't know? A couple of years ago, Bret Hart was screwed. <laughs> Vince Russo, he says was a writer under Vince McMahon. Remember when I said that Vince Russo was never the head writer, and he got so mad, and I hurt his feelings in this whole nine yards? On this very goddamn show, the story is that he was under Vince McMahon. He says, many insiders claim Russo scripted the Montreal screwjob finished that ruined Bret Hart's life. Who said that? No one. (laughs) That is a load of horseshit. That is the biggest load of horseshit I've ever heard. He's taking credit for the Montreal screw job. Are you kidding me? I hope this was some storyline here, and he's not actually claiming that he came up with this idea. They recap the screw job at Starcade, and you know, I never even thought about it before. But do you realize that Bret Hart's WWF and his WCW career both ended with a Montreal screw job? Because Starcade, he got booted in the head by Goldberg, yeah. and that was the beginning and the end of his career. He's got like a week left. Mm-hmm. This poor fucking guy. <laughs> Dude. Yeah. Can you imagine? And he got his career ending concussion in that piece of shit match. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck. So this is filled with as many time- possible mentions of the words WWF, Vince McMahon, Vince Russo, script- scripted the finish, but it's, yeah. Every time people go, man, Brett was so bitter. Or when Brett himself goes, I- I- I'm not bitter anymore. It's like, this guy deserves to be bitter. So, If ever there was someone who deserved to be bitter, it's Brett Hart. What a, what a hand he was dealt. So in what seriously may have been the most jaw-dropping moment of the Russo era on Nitro yet, they explain what the Montreal Screwjob was, how it was Vince Russo's fault, then they show more pictures of Starcade. They say last night was another Montreal screw job. Roddy Piper came out and said Goldberg quit when he didn't. And they're showing replays. And at the same time, they want you, the viewer at home, to pay money to buy the replay to watch it. Yeah. They think knowing that there's a screw job at the end is a selling point that will entice you to pay cash. Do you know to watch Vinny, the show that later in this show? As Chris Benoit and Jeff Jarrett are on the way to the ring to have a ladder match, we are told to buy the replay to see them in a ladder match. <laughs> that happened. <laughs> I, I, I think I was told. I think I it, I didn't recognize how absurd that was. Oh, I did. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, God. Kevin Nash comes out in street clothes. Oh, man. Another shoot promo. <laughs> Looking like a giant Another fan. good one. So he says, wrestling is like no other business in the world. I'll say. And I think, I think you know what? He's right. He's right about that. But mm-hmm. then he says, this is why it's unlike any other business in the world. You work 12 months out of the year. Wait a second. I'm like, well, that sounds like any fucking business. That's the same. Says the veterans spell out. The code of conduct of the job. Again, same. That sounds like a business. One of the codes, he says, in this business, a rarity, the boys never screw the boys. 
Man, that's that's unique to wrestling. Kevin Nash is describing a construction site right now. He says, what you see week in and week out is one thing. Behind the curtain, it's a different story. You got the boys, and you got the office. Very different from any other business. There's the workers, and there's management. Are you aware of this? The office, he says, here in wrestling, it's all about the money. It's all about trying to make a profit. Again. But the wrestlers, he says, they give their bodies every night. I'm like, you're saying this, Kevin Nash? (laughs) He says the office takes, they take, they take. And the office, to be frank, they don't give a shit about us. We have no benefits, no retirement, no disability. They don't even, he says, pay our Social Security. You're an independent contractor. You signed the fucking contract. What are you talking about? He says if the office can find a way to screw the boys to make a dollar, they'll do it. They don't give a damn about Goldberg. I don't give a damn about Goldberg. But what happened at Starcade was bullshit. He said shit about 15 times in this promo. Yep. It's like they're trying to be edgy. So he's everyone's saying shit a lot. The show did a fucking terrible rating, despite all the times everyone said shit, I might add. Brett broke the code. He screwed one of the boys. Brett is nothing, he says, but, quote, a piece of shit. And he leaves. Whew. Some heavy words from veteran Kevin Nash. Then they go to creative control and they go, Nash is the biggest politician in the locker room. He doesn't give a shit about anybody. I'm like, what am I watching? I don't know. What in the fuck is this show? Dude. That's... And then... I may have started taking my clothes off. This goes directly into Tank Abbott versus Jerry Flynn. Okay? <laughs> Tank Abbott and Jerry Flynn. The recently married Tank Guess what happens when they get in the ring? They get in a fight. They send out 80 guys to break them up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, did WCW think that maybe something else might happen? Well, they weren't in the boiler like, room. Like, maybe they do Seth Rollins versus Dean Ambrose, and they'd fucking tie up, and then put on a fucking chin lock? What did they expect to happen? They arrest Jerry Flynn because he got in a fight against Tank Abbott? In, in, in what was booked as a no-holds-barred match. <laughs> oh, I didn't even know that! <laughs> yeah. I hate this show. Well, I, hey. I decided. I hate it. For a while it lasted. I made one, up my mind. For a while it lasted, this one minute fight was awesome. Sure. Tank Abbott was much greater than I remembered. So, yes, uh, the minions from a Despicable Me hit the ring, separated them. <laughs> I hope you got a screenshot of that for your next pillow, by oh. the way. <laughs> God damn it. A Corvette arrives. It is Angry Bill Goldberg. At least he got a nice card this week. Yes. Remember that week he had a shitty car? Yes. And they destroyed it? So next week is New Year's Evil. A live Nitro, the last one of the century. All right, I got to apologize. Roddy Piper was the second most compelling. Uh, he is the most compelling. Hacksaw Jim Duggan yes. and Shane Douglas. Yeah. Gods. <laughs> Tremendous. Shane Douglas was the greatest heel in the world on this show. And Hacksaw Jim Duggan, I swear to God, was the most sympathetic baby face. Why isn't he at the Performance Center? That's a great question. I've never seen a more likable, sympathetic baby face. I was almost crying as a revolution was stomping on Hacksaw, trying to get him to denounce the American flag. He's practically in tears. His hair is all disheveled. He's got his, his Shawn Michaels face on. He's just looking so sad. Bottom lip poking out. Oh, this was unbelievable. A guy on Twitter asked me, why is he not in the Hall of Awesome? He is now. Okay, Hacksaw Jim Duggan. Hacksaw Jim Duggan is in the hall of absolutely awesome. My dad's favorite wrestler. God damn, he's been so awesome every time he's been on this show. This show? Yeah. In 1999. I'm not even talking about like his heyday. He's in the hall of awesome. It's official. Fontaine? Make it be. Make it be. (laughs) Okay. So... So the revolution comes out. Saturn cuts a promo on Tootsie Pops because everything's got to be funny now. Shane wants Hacksaw Jim Duggan. So they didn't mention this, but I think we talked about it last week. It was the Revolution versus Hacksaw and Mystery Partners in a trios match. And if Hacksaw lost, he would have to come out here and tear up the flag or whatever. 
Mystery Partners were the fucking Varsity Club. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in December of 1999. Coming back we from, told you they were coming. From out of the goddamn blue. They still lost. Yeah. In their re-debut. Hell of a debut. So Hacksaw is sad. He's t- bottom lip is quivering. He's just on the verge of tears. And finally he says, I'm not going to rip up that flag. And Shane Douglas says, Hacksaw, how dare you welch on this stipulation? Hacksaw says, I'm not welching on anything. I lied. And he starts <laughs> throwing punches. This is so awesome. It was like the one time in my entire time watching wrestling <laughs> that a guy reneging on a stipulation was the fucking coolest thing I ever saw. <laughs> I was living and dying with every punch. <laughs> so Hit him, Hacksaw. He's running wild. Hit Dean harder. They overwhelm him. And they're beating him up, and Shane says, To hell with those jackasses and standards and practices! We're going to burn this flag! The filthy animals come out to save the flag. Okay, <laughs> as, much, as much as I love this, okay? <laughs> Conan is dressed like a pimp, and he's got no cardio. Kidman's a skinny geek and a wife beater. And Rey Mysterio's got no legs, and he's on crutches. <laughs> the heels have a fucking blowtorch. <laughs> they still run for their lives. Yes. <laughs> so it wasn't all perfect. <laughs> what about when uh, they make the save and H- Hacksaw can't get to his feet, but he's able to grab that flag and wave it to and fro from his back? I'm crying right now. He's not a hero. Piper and her son are walking around. Was it Nick or Mick? I thought he said Mick, but I think it's Nick. All right. So Piper comes out for a promo. Says, yes, he had sold out. He's done a lot of things to Mr. T, to Jimmy Snuka, to Cindy Lopper, but he says... I am not a phony, and I don't dig this phony dog and pony baloney. That's actually what he said. Mm-hmm. At this point, he got a promo on the WWE in 2018. Nobody wants to see this badly written garbage, he says. They want to see guys fight. Yeah. It was so, this was another one of those ironies. <laughs> it's amazing. Like everything that he said. It still holds up. Yeah. So he said he was going to quit. He told every, he told everyone, "Don't hit your kids. Kiss them." Yeah. Let me go through a little. Let me of this. write that down. <laughs> First, he says, "I'm the real deal. I'm not a phony." He calls it a phony dog and pony act. He's sick of Vince Russo's clown baloney. These fans don't want to see BS. They want to see people fight. He says, "I'm a real fighter. If you want me to do this dog and pony cartoon baloney, I quit. This is the last time I'll do anything for anybody." And then, yes, he says, everyone at home, just want you to know, Christmas, it's somebody's birthday. <laughs> I, want you to, I want you to grab your kid. Don't hit him. Right. Hug him. I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I wasn't going to, Roddy. That was never my intention. I was just about to. You, oh, and Piper saved the day. <laughs> saved young Billy from a black guy. He said, I spent my entire life in this sport, but that's it. I quit. So his son, Oliver Twist, runs down. <laughs> they hug. And Goldberg comes out. Goldberg says, I stayed up all night trying to make sense of this crap. I, don't, I didn't come to any conclusions. I'm like, I spent 20 years trying to come up with some conclusions for this crap. I still haven't. He says, there are a few guys I looked up to, respectable guys. Roddy, you were one of them until last night. I once thought those same thoughts. Roddy had a decision. And as far as he's concerned, he made the wrong decision. He sold out. Goldberg, he says, I'll never do that. And Piper just says, I'm sorry, please don't be a phony. Bret Hart comes out, he's mad at the office. As far as he's concerned, he says, this belt is vacant. He says, I'm going to go into the office, and I'm going to tell them to shove this belt up their ass. I thought, okay. So, sometimes you hear a guy go, I'm going to go into the office. And I tell them to shove this belt up up their ass. Then, like, something else happens. The very next segment... <laughs> He's the fastest man alive. Brett <laughs> is in their office, and he goes, take this belt and shove it up your ass. <laughs> he was a man of his word. <laughs> the way he can move. I just want to point out, before we get to the end of the show, the end result of Starcade was Goldberg got screwed, and Bret Hart was world champion. Yes. Everyone remember that. Yes. So then Russo tells him, he admits, I guess, this time, I had nothing to do with the Survivor Series. <laughs> I was trying to make it up to you last night. I'll always make sure to mention Survivor Series, WWE, Vince McMahon. Well, the point is, like, here he's admitting, I didn't come up with the finish. Yes. Okay, if he didn't come up with the finish of Survivor Series, why did he have to make it up to him? 
Well, he felt bad for the guy. Please. I will add that right before Brett went to Russo's office, uh, Goldberg uh, told Piper, basically Goldberg forgave Piper and said everyone makes mistakes. Mm. So they're cool now. Then Russo says, you and Goldberg go out there and let him, he'll beat you up like he should have done last night. That's the match for the main event. So the announcers talking about Brett and Goldberg say the title, world championship is vacant. Didn't Brett just win this thing in a tournament like two weeks ago? Yeah. <laughs> That's vacant again. he vacated it. So Heenan says the stupidest thing Brett's ever done. Why, Brett? Why? So technically, the match that followed was <laughs> Mang and Norman Smiley versus Nobbs and Finley. Mm-hmm. It was really Mang in a handicap match against three men. Sure. Because any warm body he saw, he tried to kill it. And Norman was getting beat up and screaming. They were all fighting in the aisle. They fought up the stairs. They fought into what was described as the Kevin Sullivan Chris Benoit bathroom. Because I guess it's the same bathroom. They brought him there that one time. And then... in the, I watched the show last weekend. So at the time I watched this, it was the grossest thing I'd ever seen. <laughs> it may have been surpassed in the, since then. Sure. But they took Norman Smiley into the actual men's room in the Serena in Baltimore and gave him a real swirly in a real public toilet. Yep. I was getting queasy. <laughs> it's not. I almost did what Tom did. I thought nothing of it. Yeah, I've been potty training, and Tom <laughs> barfed everywhere. And they pin Norman after this. Piper talks to his son. Says, "Have a soda pop and stay here." Tells Steve to watch the boy. He takes his bat and he starts banging it on the walls and goes, "Nothing rubber here, baby." Because <laughs> they've had fake bats. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's telling us it's fake, except mm. when he's on screen. Right. So he's going crazy. Brett tries to reason with him. Piper's having none of it. Evan Courageous versus the fucking Maestro. You know what, Vinny? I never thought much of the Maestro, but he was not a bad worker. It's not that. He had a totally fine match with Evan Courageous. He's a, he's a perfectly fine low-card comedy guy. That's all dandy. Why is there a guy playing piano and wrestling at the same time? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> They've never offered one explanation for who he is. He's the maestro. Why he wants to play piano. This He's should just... be a self-explanatory gimmick, Vinny. Like, the barbarian. You yeah. wouldn't say, why is a barbarian eating raw meat? He's a fucking barbarian. That makes sense for a guy who then wants to get in the ring and fight people. Well, maestro is a maestro. Go down to the Seattle Symphony and see how many of your musicians there want to go get in a ring and fight people. Well, I bet you... I'm going to guess zero. I bet you could find one. And why is Meister not concerned about his breaking his fingers or hand? So, Symphony... Because it's fake. <laughs> it's been made abundantly clear on this show. It's a dog and pony show. You know, you got me there, Brian. So, Evan Courageous is the other guy, if I hadn't mentioned that. Symphony puts the moves on him. He throws her down, but he does at least feel bad about it, which puts him up above the level of most wrestlers <laughs> in 1999. And Maestro hits a knee to the back and wins. Yeah, V trigger. Yeah, <laughs> it basically was. Maestro hit a damn V trigger in 1999. It didn't look as good, but you're right. <laughs> That's what it was on paper, the same move. Okay, Roos has been around for like a month, right? Oh my god. We have seen people dragged into his office. We have seen people, uh, 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 you know, want to leave. Vinny, told not to. We have been told guard the door. Mm-hmm. Yes, we we have seen a, a, a match that takes place in the office. Where the first person to leave the office wins. Yes. Right. Roddy Piper comes through with his bat. He levels the office. It's just a set. It's yes. been a fake office this entire time. Yes. <laughs> what is the <this> show? <laughs> it, it is an acid trip. <laughs> yes. I've never been on one. Usually. I can only presume. Usually I am a fan of absurdist and ridiculous This is beyond absurdist, humor. Vinny. <laughs> This, this is just blatantly self-contradictory. Self-contradict- this whole show is just one giant oxymoron. So Piper is knocking down the set... Booked by a moron. And the furniture... Which is an oxymoron. Mm. He starts whacking the camera with, or whatever with his bat, and he's just shouting the names of dead wrestlers. I loved you, Owen! Adrian Adonis. Adrian Adonis. Gorilla Girl. Monsoon! Owen Hart. Chavo Guerrero tries to sell a book to Evan. How to pick up chicks. Is this fucking Chavo thing going anywhere? No, of course not. Does he just sell shit until Nitro goes off the air? I think Ziggler's brother wrote that book, by the way. (laughs) So Evan beats Chavo's ass. Things going great for Chavo these days. Champagne Canyon cuts a promo. He still has his morgue music. Yep. It's been weeks now. (laughs) He's California, Hollywood Canyon or whatever. 
It's got fucking morgue music. Yeah. Oh, so he claimed, he takes credit for blowing up the triad because he beat up Bigelow and Page. Now he's going to beat them both up at once. So it's a three-way. Canyon versus Page versus Bigelow. I was trying to figure out why Page and Bigelow had heat. It turns out they didn't. They both hate Canyon. This is the opportunity to both beat him up. So the psychology is bass backwards. But it was funny. Watch them <laughs> take turns. All I know is when the bell rang and they did a triple lockup, I was so disgusted. Then I realized I was watching Nitro. <laughs> it was one of the less goofy things on this show. Yeah. So, yeah. So Clarence Mason, whose name is Mr. Biggs, I think he had laryngitis, but they put him on the mic anyway. Yeah, great idea. So he's rasping. I can't understand a word. What are you saying? So let's cut to the chase. Yeah. Kenya hits Bigelow with a champagne bottle. Of course, it's a real one. He busts his head open hard way, yeah. nearly kills him. He realizes that this is the same week that Goldberg nearly cut his own arm off, punching a hole through a limo window. And right around this time, Brett speeds out of the building in a car that he has to drive as the stuntman, and he fucking spins out on the ice like you did the other day and almost kills himself. Yeah, actually. Like, I mean, this is the nicest way possible. Russo did not appear to give a shit about anybody. No. Like, dude, these are human beings. Yeah. What the fuck's this guy hitting a guy with a real fucking bottle for? I don't know. Why is Goldberg punching through a fucking glass window? Why is Dallas Page jumping out of the ring, kissing yes. a random fan at ringside, and it's not Kimberly Page, and nobody says anything about it? Yeah, don't... Uh, Brian, all your points are very valid. But as far as what goes hap- what happens in this match, it's a three-way where Page takes the time to lay out Canyon, oh. turn on Bam Bam, hit a diamond cutter. He's got the match won. He starts to leave. He goes back to kiss somebody. Yeah. And then he leaves for real. Yeah. What the hell did you even lock up in a triple lockup? Why did you come out? Yeah. Why did you do this match? What was the point of any of this? And then, as noted, Canyon busted a real bottle over Bam Bam's head and pinned his bloody tattooed flames and pinned him. Backstage, Kevin Nash walks. We're alerted that Liz hit Sting with a baseball bat and broke his head. Because... Sting is a fucking moron. Here's the whole, here's the whole way it went down. Sting knew that Liz was going to screw him at the pay-per-view, so he switched her mace with silly string. So when she went to mace him, she silly stringed him. Yeah, then ha. she hit him in the back of the head with a baseball bat, yes. and she still screwed him in the end. Yes. So everyone's stupid. No, only him. He's stupid. Kevin Nash versus Creative Control. I'm running out of steam. Handicap match. Ever remember this? Kevin Nash and Creative Control hate each other. Oh my god, they, we got so much left. They have this big fight. Creative Control is still the tag champs a week later. I was legit surprised. Oh, I totally forgot this. I for- fucking forgot this. There's no ref in this match. Right. It's a fight. It's Creative Control versus Kevin Nash in a fight that happens to be in the ring. But Creative Control, noble sportsmen that they are, are tagging in and out. Yeah. <laughs> I completely forgot about that until yep. right now. That's more infuriating than a Falls Count Anywhere match. The guy gets counted out. It may of. actually be. Yeah. It may actually be worse. Just because this is just... this is That that defied logic. This is just outright stupid. This show sucks, I wrote. <laughs> no finish. I remember earlier... No shit. Earlier, no ref. In the... Earlier in Nitro, we couldn't see uh, Jerry Flynn and, and uh, Tank Abbott go at it. They had to send guys in. Yes. But this is okay. Yes. What are we doing? I don't know. What are we? <laughs> Let's at least talk about Jared and Ben won a ladder match. I, 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 move on. I do want to add right before that. Scott Hall last night was supposed to wrestle Ben won the ladder match, but he could not because he was injured. Right. So he comes out here on crutches, but then he's fine. He uses the crutches as weapons. Yes. No one mentions he faked an injury to get out of this ladder match. Right. Yes. Okay. Lex and Liz moxing in the rafters. Benoit walks, and now we have this ladder match. Finally. Mm-hmm. You know what's funny is is as I'm watching this match, I remembered every single move. Move for move in this match, up until when Benoit starts climbing the ladder and it breaks. Yeah, well, yeah. That must have been when I hit rewind. Yeah, we, and I we, watched the first part again. Yes. Over and over and over and over and over They again. didn't booby trap the ladder. They didn't sabotage the Who ladder. Who gives a shit about this gimmick ladder? They gimmicked they the gimmicked ladder. The wrestling in this match was so awesome. Benoit was so good at his job. He gave this man the most profound beating. I will never forget... 
Brian and I sitting on his couch in December of 99. We ran, we ran and watched this over and over and over again. Yep. I, I When it happened here, I knew it was this match, and I said, I, I knew the four spots. Chop. Yep. Whip into the chair. Yep. Hit him with a chair. Yep. Suplex onto the chair. Yep. And you know what? <laughs> How many times... Have we remembered something that's great and gone back to watch it? It didn't hold up. This held up. This fucking held up. Yep. This was amazing. You've never seen a guy give a guy a worse beating in a in like a gimmick match, but he didn't actually hurt the guy at all. Right. He made it look like this was the most violent ladder match I've ever seen. I expected Jared's it arms was a head chop, to fall off. A suplex, a chair shot, and, and, and a whip into the and a whip into the buckle where he took his own bump. Yes. Dude. Just amazing. So, Benoit gets a ladder, goes to climb it, all the rungs break. Somebody so has gimmicked the ladder, they say. And then Benoit gets kabonged as we are now in the great era of watching Chris Benoit take shots to the head. That's fantastic. Jarrett gets a shoot ladder, and he wins. <laughs> Gene accuses Jarrett of gimmicking the ladder. Jarrett says what happened to Starkey was bullshit. And then Hennig interrupts, says, you need to go to Russo's limo. Sid versus the damn wall. This actually happened. Yeah, it was horrible. The best part of this... There wasn't one. They're brawling outside. Sid grabs a water bottle off the desk, and he clonks Wall in the head with it. There's a big splash of water. And Tony Schiavone says, Sid Vicious nails him with a bottle of water. The only good thing about this was, and there was one good thing, but it was after the match, so I don't, I don't feel I'm wrong. Berlin interviews for the lame DQ. Sid takes one look at Berlin, and he does a Hulk Hogan. <laughs> he points right at him, and Alex Wright sells it, and then Sid power bombs the shit out of him. He actually did. I loved it. Sid and the Wall shook hands. Yeah, great. Forming a horrible union. <laughs> Jarrett gets news that it's gonna happen tonight. Mm. Russo couldn't tell him it's bigger than both of them. Tony Marinara talks to his dad, who's there this week. Chuck Zito. Mm-hmm. No, how about that? Yeah. They have Disco. Calls Disco Glenn. There's some horrible buzzing going on in this segment. Dude, it is horrible, but like <laughs> they're they're asking Disco, like, why do you keep running? Why do you keep fighting the guys? Disco says, and I quote, they tried to put me in a body bag. What was I supposed to do? <laughs> He's not wrong. No. Fair point. Clint. Boss so, says, I like you, but you're pissing me off. I'm going to give you two choices. Here are the two choices. Yeah. You can join the family and do what you're told, mm-hmm. or die. <laughs> join the family. <laughs> that's, that are, and that's, I, I guess... That's what he said. I guess Disco gets a week to think about it, because they cut away, we never got the Why answer. does he need to think? <laughs> I want to know, why do they want Disco in the family? Hell if I know. What, what does Disco have to offer? Well, if you've watched if you've watched the skits, everything. That's true. He's outsmarted the other two idiots at every turn. <laughs> that's true. I guess that's He'd true. He'd be the brains of the he operation. He'd be the best man in the crew. All right. Brett is stretching. Goldberg is putting gloves on. Harlem Heat and the goddamn Varsity Club. With Leia Meow. With Leia Meow. Yeah. <laughs> so, Leia Meow comes out. She has a graphic. It reads in clear letters. Leia Meow. Mm-hmm. The former Kimono on a Leia. That's who she was. ECW. That was not on the graphic, Craig. No. But it was there. So Kevin Sullivan sits down at the announce desk and Tony says, Hey, what's the name of your cheerleader? Kevin says, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> so they don't watch the show either. No. So the Varsity Club, who are randomly back together after They're the Lucha a House Party. Decade. Yeah. They are, in fact. <laughs> Sullivan leaves to do commentary. He tags in, wrestles. Steiner tags back in, Rotunda tags in. They just take turns doing it. No one cares. Uh, Kevin on Sullivan refers to Rick Steiner as Robbie Steiner. Yep. Mm, yeah. His real name. There's fucking chin locks in this match. Finally, Midnight shows up. Stevie <sighs> tells her to hit the bricks, even though he's winning. And Rotunda rolls him up from behind, pins him. I felt like I've been watching this show for a thousand years at this point. I mm-hmm. feel like that's still right now. Two geeks hit the ring. I, I swear to God, I thought, what are these fucking fans doing here? Why hasn't anyone <laughs> run them over yet? If I, It's PG-13. If I was stunned to see Varsity Club win a match on Nitro in December yes. of 99, when they got attacked by PG-13... <laughs> Seriously, did somebody Photoshop the network? Was this sabotage? <laughs> this cannot have happened. It happened. PG-13 attacking the Varsity Club on Nitro. <laughs> yeah. This sounds like somebody put Memphis... And Jim Crockett and Nitro in a blender. And this popped out on accident. That's what happened. 
Daphne, Speaking of weird segments, Daphne is now randomly. She's like she's like Stacy. She's like BB. Like a couple of weeks <laughs> she ago, she was a fan. She was a fan. Now she's just part of the damn show. Sure, the misfits are hitting on her. She knees them in the balls. I wrote kisses him. Apparently, she bit his nose. I thought she kissed him too, but they said, "Yeah, she bit his nose off." And she screamed. David is now with Daphne. Yeah, they attacked the ring announcer. They Put call- the worst boots ever to the guy. Yes. So Vampiro comes out. They're doing this verbal back and forth. David Penzer's on the ground, deceased. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> talking over his corpse. <laughs> so Vamp insults David, and then just turns his back, and David attacks him with a crowbar. What a dipshit Vampiro turned out to be. He was an absolute moron. Ever turn your back on a man with a crowbar. Especially after you insult him. Yes. So the misfits run out. They get attacked. Nobody cares for the life of me. There's not a human being in all the world in 99 who would have cared about David, Flair, and Daphne feuding against Vampiro and the misfits. Mm -hmm. There's no one to like here. There's no one to cheer for. And there's no reason. We don't know why they're fighting even really. The medics tend to the misfits backstage. Gene with Bagwell. Yes. Gene says, hey, tell me about the rumors of you and Kimberly. He tries to shut him up. Gene says, if you leave without saying anything, you're admitting your guilt. So then Bagwell starts going, well, you know, she's a 10 on my scale. Gene says, I want to know if you've been there. He says, well, you know, if DDP wasn't married to Kimberly, Buff would put his stuff all over. That's gross. What? He said that. (laughs) What? He said that, and then as he's laughing and smiling, his sunglasses randomly pop off, Mm -hmm. like a champagne cork. It was amazing. (laughs) Uh, So he's talking about, like, in graphic detail about having Kimberly in bed. Finally, Dallas Page's music hit, Bagwell is stunned. Oh, yeah. was caught off guard. Oh, shit. And this talk about graphically explaining how he fucked a man's wife (laughs) to bring that man out to kill him. Now, before all that happened, the first part of this promo... Bagwell's putting himself over. He says, I have won four world tag titles with three different partners. That's never been done before. In this very company, Art Anderson won five titles with four partners. Huh. Well, that's not four with three. I suppose not. <laughs> also, in the background, somebody is holding up a sign reading www.consensual.com. And a security guard took it away. No, <laughs> I did not type that into my I'm computer. Not, I'm not typing it in. No. Rob's on the. Oh, uh, Rob. He's on the case. <laughs> Make sure you put on private. You're going to send the cops here. Private mode. I'm Piper, not an amateur, Vinny. Piper says goodbye to Sid. Sid wishes him a Merry Christmas. Okay. The, I like what Sid said to Nick. See you, little kid. <laughs> All right, Rob, the way you spell it, U N. Would you get out of here? So, Piper says, I want you guys to know, he's speaking of the locker room, including PG 13. I want you guys to know you're the best group of athletes that have ever come along this business. You must demand more. Two years from now, he says, you'll all be burned out. They'll take you in the back and put a bullet in you. Wow! <laughs> Look at that guy. He says, I'm no genetic freak, but I had balls. I never saw my kids take their first steps or say their first words. I sacrificed my family to build this business. My kids cry every time I leave. This generation can do one thing my generation never could. Stand up, he says. Stick together. Form a union. I cried with laughter. <laughs> and Spoiler then he, alert. No union was formed. Said Merry Christmas and left. <laughs> yes, Rob, you're dying to tell us what you found. So, uh, yeah, you're all going to be horribly disappointed. Uh, there's nothing on consensual.com. I'm not just, disappointed ju- just at all. A, just an ad to say this domain is available to purchase. So oh, any, anyone who's uh, an aspiring entrepreneur, if you're that guy, com, hey, let's buy available. it and point it to wrestlingobserver.com. All right. <laughs> so, Bret Hart, who had screwed Goldberg and kept the title, in a match with Goldberg for the vacant world title, ref gets bumped. Hall and Nash attack with baseball bats. Brett takes one. Brett attacks Goldberg with a bat as, two, bat as well. So Piper runs out. Piper attacks Brett. He lays on Goldberg. The ref recovers. The ref counts three and awards the belt to Brett. Yes. Right? Yep. I, 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 the ref was down, and apparently the ref was confused. And when Piper laid on Goldberg and would not get off, the ref was just like, I'm going to count the pin. <laughs> He awards a title to Bret Hart, who Tony announces is the new champion. And at first I was like, no, he was the champion. <laughs> Are you confused? You thought Goldberg was a champion? Then I realized he had vacated and won the belt back on this show. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. He screwed Goldberg to keep the title just so the next night he could screw Goldberg to win the title. Well, now he's a two-time champion. What the fuck? <laughs> this is a bad show. This, is, this makes no sense. It's awful. So Jarrett runs out, hits Piper with a the guitar. They spray paint NWO on Piper and Goldberg, and this is this is funny. So you- hold on, before you get to that, I think they think, I think their idea was, Brett went to all of this trouble so that he would convince everyone that he was a babyface so that they could lure Goldberg into a trap. Did we really need to lure Goldberg into a trap? The same trap? The trap trap was they went to have a match and dudes ran in and beat him up. Yes. That's your fucking trap that you had to lure him into? Yeah. This is a poor television show. This is a lot of work for a little reward. So they go to spray paint NWO on these guys. Now you recall a year or two ago. Yeah, the NWO. Yeah, they're back. If you didn't know. And it's Brett and the Outsiders and Jarrett. So a year or two ago, a year or two ago, the NWO was running wild, and they spray painted Goldberg. And the end of it, just for fun, they spray painted his head. Yeah, and he was really, really pissed. Fast forward to this event when they go to spray paint the NWO logo on him, and they get the N in his chest and the W in his belly, and then they are very, 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 very careful to spray paint the O on his leg and not his trunks. So they won't ruin his gear mm-hmm. and give him reason to murder them. I laughed and Stay laughed the hell and away laughed. from his head, too. And his head. So, yeah, everyone, the NWO is just back. The it, band it, is back together. They the, play the NWO music. This whole fucking thing was a scheme put together over the past, like, if you go back, like, two months, it goes back to the Outsiders. The Outsiders trying to interfere when Brett won the title in the first place. Why, when Brett won the title in the first place, didn't they just say, hey, we're the NWO now? Why, why was it a secret? Because he had to do a, a swerve. And the epitome of WCW in 99, Brett picks up the mic to say something to the crowd, and the mic doesn't work. <laughs> so, I mean, I want to mention we should not gloss over the fact that somebody asked me a couple of days ago, are you sure that Brett got that concussion at Starcade because he wrestled on Raw? Right. Or on Nitro? Yeah. Yeah, that's the point. Yeah. He got concussed at Starcade, mm-hmm. then he wrestled the next night, uh-huh. then he does like a bunch of house show matches. He was on the planes. He starts doing hardcore matches with Terry Funk. And yes, by the way, any moment now, Terry Funk is back. I think he shows up like next week or something like that. So yeah, this was the beginning of the end. And if you watch this show, like, Brett got his promo out, but he doesn't look good in that main event. No. He looks messed up, because he was messed up. Mm-hmm. So we are, we are witnessing week to week the end of the career of the great Bret Hart. Yeah. Because they threw his ass in the ring and he just kept wrestling. Yeah. Well, here's your music, Vinny. I hope it goes through like eight times. This, this may be a record. This band is back together again. <laughs> the finishes on this terrible show were pin in an intergender match after distraction in a foreign object, pin after like eight distractions by a crazy old guy, no finish due to run in by security, pin in the bathroom after swirly, pin after distraction. Pin after a champagne bottle shot after a third guy had the match won but just left. No finish in a handicap match where guys were doing tags with no ref. Win in a ladder match after the first ladder was gimmicked. DQ due to interference from a guy's own manager. Pin after a guy was distracted by his own valet or manager or whatever midnight is. Pin for the world championship when a guy who is not in the match pins a guy who is in the match, but then another guy who is in the match wins. Wow. <laughs> I cannot properly express how happy I am when Tuesday night's over. <laughs> we are at war. Uh, it was a team effort, I think, but I, I think this afternoon, uh, when you laid out the plan that we wanted to do, I went through and did the math and verified that, that the plan would work. So we're good to go. Yeah. And this, I was alerted, was the final ever three-hour Nitro. Yeah. That's wonderful news. It is. It was a horrible show. It is. A wretched, wretched show. I, I couldn't actually even understand half the show. So I guess I guess in some ways it wasn't as bad as usual because I just didn't know what the hell was going on. Maybe that makes it worse. I'm not sure. But uh, I think somebody said that they expected this to be the worst Nitro that we'd ever seen, and I don't think I could go that far. Maybe I'm wrong. I was just mostly bored, but let's get into it and uh, and see. So we have WCW Monday Nitro number 223, December 27th, 1999. Now, you mentioned this is the last three-hour Nitro, but 
In fact, there's a disclaimer saying there were technical difficulties that would be presented in the fullest possible form, and then it comes up as just slightly under two hours. Instead That's right. Usual, it was like it was like an hour and fifty five minutes. Yeah, which means that it was about twenty minutes shorter than your usual three hour nitro. Right. And I guess uh, our good friend Lance has already taken a look at next week's Nitro. And next week's Nitro is one hour and 35 minutes long. Oh, that sounds wonderful. Oh, it's going to be the best. I, I cannot wait. I, I shed a tear. I think Lance might have shed a tear. I think we'll all shed a tear losing an hour of this wretched show. But, yeah, technical difficulties. I don't know what they cut out. Uh, there was there was a, a deal with three count that just kind of sort of... It's like it was joined in progress. Yes, it... Uh, well, I can talk about it now. Three Count debuted in the show. Was it this show or was it on Thunder? Well, they made their Nitro debut on this show. I can tell you that much. Well, sure. yes, that they did. Uh, and apparently the song they danced to, while it was not copyrighted music, it was, uh, let's see if I can find the tweet right away. Someone let me know. It was, it was very close to a, you know, it was a blatant ripoff of a popular song. And they may have figured better safe than sorry and just skip ahead. Mm. So, well, there you go. Yeah. All right. So, uh, to catch up on everything. We had clips from Thunder, where Goldberg smashed his arm through a car window Mm -hmm. and busted it all to hell. He shredded a tendon. He needed surgery. And they claimed that he would be back at some point. And at the time, there were varying, I guess, they claim maybe four weeks. Other people claimed it would be like three months. But anyway, he practically tore his arm off. Now... Last week on this show, I went on this big tirade about Russo not giving a shit about anybody because we had a bottle smashed over somebody's head and we had Goldberg smashing his arm through a car window and we had Bret Hart speeding out of control and an icy ice rink or whatever. It was actually just the ground, but it was icy and I don't know what the hell he's doing driving the car. And Apparently Russo was very upset about this accusation that he didn't care about anybody and his claim is that it was a sugar bottle that was used. Hmm. Okay? Now listen, I'm not going to call Vince Russo a liar. All right? I wasn't there. This is all I know. First off, when he smashed the bottle over Bam Bam Bigelow's head last week, it sure as shit sounded like a real bottle to me. That's number one. Number two, Bam Bam Bigelow's head was busted open immediately. Bleeding everywhere. Yes. Now, I I guess Russo's claiming that, hey, you know, you can get cut open with a sugar bottle. All right? Now, I don't know if that's true. I did a lot of Googling on this subject, and all I heard was that these sugar bottles are very, very, very fragile. Like, when you order, you can order sugar bottles. I think you can even order them off Amazon. And the company basically says, I mean, your bottles may arrive destroyed. Because they're very, very fragile, all right? So, last week, Canyon's wielding this bottle. He's holding it by the neck of the bottle, all right? This is not like a fake beer bottle. It was a fake champagne bottle. He's holding it by the neck. He's swinging it around with liquid in it, all right? I'm very skeptical that a sugar bottle is going to survive holding onto it by the neck and swinging it around while liquid's flying everywhere. Not to mention busting somebody open hard way when you hit him over the head with it, all right? So, that's all I'm saying here. That's his side of the story. I uh, will just add yes. that uh, on the concept of uh, wrestlers using real uh, glass in items, we're also talking about here, Goldberg put his can through a real car window. Exactly. So, they, they as a company have lost the benefit of the doubt. Yes. If you're going to be using sugar bottles, why aren't you using sugar glass? Why aren't you putting sugar glass in the windows of a limousine? For those of you who don't remember what happened, Goldberg, I guess they gave him like some metal gimmick that he was going to hold in his hand. So when he, when he hit the window, like the, the metal gimmick was going to break the window. And I guess at some point, like he dropped the metal gimmick. And so he used his hand to actually smash through the window. But I mean, whether you give the guy a gimmick in his hand or not, why is Goldberg smashing through a legitimate glass window? That's a great question. Seriously, that's completely insane. As far as skidding out of control in a car, I guess Russo claimed, don't blame me, I just write the stuff, blame the stunt coordinator. Well, it was the stunt coordinator's fault, too. Like, why is why is Bret Hart speeding out of anywhere in a car? All right? Fine. Maybe that one wasn't Vince Russo's fault. All right? I don't know what happened. 
But this is this is insanity. There's shit like this on, on the show every single week. And it's not just this show. It's it's raw. Like there there's there are people hitting each other with glass bottles and shit on raw. And it's just it's it's too dangerous here in the nineties. If anybody's gonna try and argue with me that it wasn't too dangerous in the nineties, get out of here. I didn't want to hear it. We're Don't even, even bother. About, we're not even talking about what was going on, going on in ECW at the time with New Jack no. and Vic Grimes and Mike Awesome and Masato Tanaka. Yeah. <laughs> The, the whole era needs to be wiped clean. Or can't be wiped clean. We just have to deal with it. So, yes, we had a recap of Goldberg putting his arm through a goddamn car window and smearing blood all over the hood of the car. The, the, the I don't want to say best part, but he smashes the first two windows and everything's fine. And he smashes that third one and it's immediately clear something's gone terribly wrong. And he goes up to the hood of the car and he looks at the windshield, which I guess he was supposed to smash too. And he kind of takes two feeble shots at it with his left hand. And he wipes his arm on the hood just to make sure blood gets everywhere. Yeah, a bad thing. All right, hey, stand by, Vinny. All right, we're back, everybody. I fixed Vinny's mic. We had some complaints last time that when Vinny got agitated, it sounded uh, horrible. So we've fixed everything. We should be good to go. Let's go, Vinny. So here on Nitro to start, Bret Hart, Kevin Nash, and Jeff Jarrett are walking backstage. A lot of walking on the show. Yes. So then the announcers talk for, I don't know, 30, 40 minutes. They're just at this desk with a one one camera shot on them and never changes. They just talk and talk and talk. So, the news they have to discuss. Goldberg has shredded a tendon in his arm, but he should return. Nobody has seen Scott Hall since Goldberg beat him up on Thunder. He did not show up at the pay-per-view. I guess it was a pay-per-view. Uh, he did not show up, well, today. So, Executive Vice President of WCW, Bill Bush, has had enough of the direction of the powers that be, Vince Russo and Ed Ferrara. It was decreed by Executive Vice President Bill Bush that if Scott Hall did not show up at the Houston Astrodome, where Nitro was, by 7 p.m., the Outsiders would be stripped of the tag team titles. That deadline had come and gone. The Outsiders are no longer tag team champions. The powers that be, who are apparently still in charge, even though we were just told they were not in charge. Confused yet? I am all right. They have booked a lethal lottery New Year's Evil tag team tournament. Yes. I'll we'll start tonight. Yes. So, by the way, there was no Russo on this show. Dr. Claw's gone for the time being. And, yes, we're doing a lethal lottery. It's one of those things where, I guess when Russo was growing up, growing up he thought the lethal lottery was really cool. But it sucked. It did horrible business. It was never a success. And here we are doing the Lethal Lottery in 1999. If you're going to do one of these, and we'll get into this, but have an air of authenticity and believability. Throw some random matchups out there. Don't have every single one be a combination of either a guy fighting his own partner or a guy teaming with his enemy or both. It just makes the whole thing stupid. You know what? They also announced, and I just realized this right now, they announced Bret Hart versus Jerry Flynn for the world title. We didn't see that match. No, I was not. I'll be honest. I was not paying attention to the actual matches they discussed. I was yeah. just recapping the news. I was because I was listening and I thought, Bret Hart versus Jerry Flynn for the championship? What the fuck's going on? So I guess that was lost in the technical difficulties. I suppose so. It's bizarre. Which is a shame. I don't know if I'd call it a shame, but <laughs> it would have been something. Brian Knobs versus Bam Bam Bigelow with Canyon on commentary. So Canyon, the gimmick is he comes out doing his entrance and he's got the, uh, the, the, the mic headset. So he's doing his own commentary and then he ended up doing commentary for the matches that went outside the ring. But the point is the audio quality of this mic was terrible. Just awful. Yeah, it was like, it was like the mic was only feeding through the loudspeakers in the building, but there was no like direct feed to the back. So that, I don't even know how many people were here in this building, but it sounded like there was nobody there. Just this this horrible, cavernous, echoing sound whenever anybody talked on the mic. So very quickly, they brawl through the crowd. Canyon follows them to do commentary. The cameras do not follow them. So I counted. There's 90 seconds of this where we can barely see the rest of this at all. Occasionally, one or the other of their heads will pop into view. Mostly, we're looking at the backs of fans' heads. And we don't see what happens, 
But Canyon is following them. We hear Canyon say, one, two, three, Knobs wins. Yeah. I don't know what was going what on. What the fuck was this? I, I presume that they had a match, and I guess maybe there were supposed to be cameras there, but there weren't. So we just saw the crowd, and we heard Canyon talking about being amongst the marks. And Yes. Which, think about that, by the way. And then all of a sudden, they just rang the bell, and I guess there was a winner. But It was Knobs. Yeah, if, I guess Knobs won. If Canyon is to be believed. And I mean, he's not. He's a heel. Well, that's true. <laughs> we, we have no proof otherwise. I, I I think we must just take his word for it. I'm connecting a lot of dots here, but I think Canyon probably screwed Bam Bam, and thus Knobs won. Hmm. It would be nice if they gave us that information. It would. I'm, I'm speculating at best, but it would fit. A Cadillac arrives. Sid and Chris Benoit are in it. Conveniently, there's also a monster truck in the back just sitting there. Uh, how about that? The NWO harasses J.J. Dillon. This is also mic'd terribly. Dude, isn't it to harass him? They're back there, and they 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 hand the tag belts over to J.J. Dillon because, of course, Nash has been stripped because Hall didn't show up. And J.J.'s like, don't, you know, don't, don't kill the messenger. Like, I'm not the one that decreed this. You should be mad at Bill Bush, who, by the way, just randomly has now appeared as a character on television. You never see the guy, but like now he's in the random new authority figure. So then they beat his ass. And I thought, like, where's Bill Bush? Like, shouldn't they be suspended or or fined or both? Like, they're beating up J.J. Dillon here. And it's the same thing that we've seen since 1996. Grown men beating up dudes in the back, spray painting them, the whole NWO deal. It's just so dated. So after the break, the NWO, it, it's their monster truck. And they are inspecting it, and they are very impressed. Then they find a Cadillac. It's just... <laughs> Sid did not pull up into a parking spot. He pulled up in front of the gates and just parked it in the middle of everything and left. And he also left the lights on. So the NWO finds Sid's car. They note the lights are on. And then Nash says, let's get the gimmicks, man. Oh, man, the gimmicks. Mm-hmm. Sid comes out for a promo. Sid and Benoit, I don't want to alarm you, their mics are terrible. I can understand a word they said. What the hell is going on on the show? I know that uh, Sid and Bret Hart are facing off. It's sold out for the <laughs> that championship. That is the booked match. Yes. Yep. He's going to powerbomb Bret straight to hell, just like he did with Kevin Nash. Mm-hmm. And then Benoit is also echoing throughout the building. And the camera's shaking. <laughs> and the production. What a horrible television show this <laughs> is. Absolutely horrible. So, Bret... Or, I'm sorry, Benoit announces that he's going to be involved in Triple Threat Theater. Let me repeat that. Triple Threat Theater. He says, first, there will be a dungeon rules only match. This is with Jeff Jarrett. No ropes, no way out, pinfall or submission. You leave, you lose. Then he says... It's a bunkhouse brawl. I had to watch this like ten times to determine he said bunkhouse brawl. It was it was very very difficult to to determine there, and then he says the third match is going to be caged heat. So yeah, it's triple threat theater, where each of the three stages also has a wacky nickname. Yes. So so what you might ask is caged heat. Chris Benoit says, it's a cage match. Two men enter, one man leaves. Oh, God. I was like, that's caged heat? So, yes. <laughs> and it kind of makes me sad that, that Benoit ends up leaving and going to WWE. We never saw the the triple threat theater, if I recall correctly. Yeah, spoiler alert, this, this pay-per-view goes horribly, horribly wrong. Oh, too bad. I really wanted to see triple threat theater. Well, it happens, but Benoit's not involved. Yes. But we'll get to that. So I just want to know, he announces the th- these three matches, and he says, best two out of three wins. Yeah. So does that mean if Jeff Jarrett, for example, wins the Dungeon Rules match, and then also wins the Bunkhouse Brawl, he's already won two, do they even bother with the Caged Heat? I presume they don't do Caged Heat. Or is this canceled? 
I, I presume it would be canceled at that or point. Or are we just supposed to think that it's fake and destined to go to Three Falls? Well, that too. The NWO in the parking lot has now tagged Sid's car. Three grown men tagging Sid's car in 2000. Just like, dude. There's a cartoon of Sid on the hood that actually looks like Sid. And then I remembered, Bret Hart was a talented cartoonist. He was. He was a very talented cartoonist. So I'm sure he did this part. Sid should have been happy. Yeah. I mean, of all things. I mean, <laughs> I his, if I go that far, but... his own likeness on his car, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Vinny, your new Jeep... If Bret Hart showed up and, and drew your likeness on the hood of that Jeep, you ain't complaining. I, I think I would, actually. Uh. I'd rather have no likeness on the hood of my Jeep. Hmm. I'm fine with it being plain. Hmm. So Sid and Ben Wall go running to the car. Sid was definitely not fine with his car being having his own likeness. He was so angry, in fact, that I believe he said, God dog it! <laughs> God dog it. And he followed that up with, man! Yeah, I love Sid. All right. Let the Lethal Lottery New Year's Evil Tag Team Tournament begin. By the way, they're calling it New Year's Evil because it's obviously close to the end of the year. But this tournament is actually stretching over several weeks. Yeah. So it's going to go into well past the New Year's Eve. Well, December 27th is close to New Year's Eve, so it's New Year's Evil. Yeah, but next I, round. I know. I know. Okay. It's so stupid. Opening match, Buzzkill and Mike Rotunda versus Conan and Dean Malenko. Yes. So Buzzkill, now, in case you weren't, uh, just to make it clear, they're ripping off Road Dog. He now has the New Age Outlaws ripoff music. He's doing the exact same promo. It's the exact a same total catchphrases. rip off of the music. Can you imagine being told we need to go rip off your younger brother? Yeah, that's what he was doing, dude. Yeah. In fact, he even said that in storyline. <laughs> so of course, in a random draw. Luck of the draw, we have Conan of the Filthy Animals teaming with Dean Malenko of the Revolution. What a damn coincidence. It's amazing how this works. Yeah. For 60 seconds, we had Dean Malenko wrestling his ass off with these 1980s guys knew how to work, and it was so awesome, and it couldn't last. Dean and Conan start fighting. A brawl breaks out. Buzzkill pins Dean. This totally sucked, and then Tony Schiavone warns us, We've got seven more matches like this to go. Buzzkill Pin Malenko. Hacksaw was there. Leia Meow was there. Oh, I didn't write all this down. Yeah. Oh, my God. The Revolution was there. Oh, there's... And you're killing me here. There's like... I couldn't write it all down because there's so much going on at once. Yes. This there's was... a brawl on the floor, interference from two women, and a janitor with a stick. All getting involved here. All at the exact same goddamn time. That's why I didn't bother to write it down. I forgot about it until you brought it up and made me mad. It's a good thing we changed that mic gain. I, might get I may need to turn it down one more. Want me to? Yeah, go do it. All right, hang on. Let's do this live, everybody. Vince is getting so agitated. We're just going to try to keep making this work better. All right. All right, there we go. Let's down one more. Okay. <laughs> Backstage, the NWO sabotages the TV truck. We briefly go off the air. And then tragedy struck. The show returned. Yeah, come back and the picture's still messed up. Broadcast quality is not up to our standards, they say. Yes. So a limo arrives. Scott Steiner gets out with his big giant back brace and a cane. And Rick is there to greet him, give him a hug, and get out of his wheelchair. Did any fucking viewer not know exactly where this was going? How many times have they done this angle? Not only that, they just did the whole NWO swerve last week. Yes. When everything is a swerve, none of them are surprises, so none of them are swerves. The NWO destroyed catering. Oh, great. These poor, innocent croissants and muffins went flying. Oh, the worst. Shane, oh, who you've forgotten, is uh, uh, Virgil. Vincent. Shane McMahon gimmick. Yeah, Vincent, Virgil, Shane. Curly Bill, yes. Curly Bill. Now, he's supposed to be Shane McMahon, but for some reason, he's out there in a shirt and tie, which I don't think Shane had ever worn at this point. Uh, Yeah, he did a little bit. All right, well, he's fighting Tank Abbott. He didn't wrestle in it, but like he showed up on TV in it. Okay. He's fighting Tank Abbott. Tank knocks him, wins by knockout in 30 seconds. So the match, everybody, is Tank Abbott versus Shane, okay? That's what, that, that's what in storyline, World Championship Wrestling signed Tank Abbott versus Shane, okay? Tank Abbott goes in there. 
He knocks him out with a one-punch KO. Shane is dead. The referee sees that he is a corpse. He does not call for the bell. Billy Silverman decides, I need to raise his arm three times. So Tank punches him in the head again. Fucking referee raises his arm, drops once. Tank punches him in the fucking head a second time. <laughs> referee raises his arm. I'm like, dude, it's over. You fucking moron. Did you mention Tank choking Shane with his own tie while punching him in the head? Yes. So finally the ref calls for the bell and the match is over. And the most bizarre thing I've ever seen, Tank Abbott stops hitting the guy because a ref finally called for the bell. Tank Abbott is a UFC fighter. He's been trained like, you know, don't stop punching until the ref stops it. Sure. He starts walking around the ring. He's just all full of pride that he won with a one-punch KO. And all of a sudden, Doug Dillinger and security and cops hit the ring to get rid of... I'm like, what in the fuck is supposed to be going on here? He won the match clean as a sheet. He stopped hitting the guy when the referee stopped the fight. And now you brought out cops? What's happening here? I don't know. Why does nothing on this show make sense? I don't know. Why were there cops out there? I don't know. He didn't know. break one rule. I don't know. Why was choking him with a tie? Fuck. <laughs> well, then it's the <laughs> ref's job to say, quit choking the guy with his fucking tie. That's the best I can The do. ref was busy raising the guy's... I hope the cops were out there to arrest the referee. Yeah, Maybe that's what sense. happened. Yes. Backstage, Rick Steiner pushes Scott around in his wheelchair. So there's this New Year's Evil sweepstakes. And we were told the winners of this sweepstakes would be flown to this show here in the Astrodome. And after the show, they will get to party with wrestlers and the Nitro Girls. And they show these fans. Dude. That's all I can say. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. I am a fair man. This is a terrible show. This is an awful show. But there was one great thing on it. Yes. The Scott Steiner tribute video. So it's a decade of Scott Steiner whipping ass. And he's suplexing dudes and Frankensteinering them and throwing them around. He's got this sweet mullet. and He's got his huge biceps. And he just looks awesome. And they're talking about how through all the years, his third, fourth, and fifth vertebrae had ruptured. Oh. And after a second consultation with his doctor, Scott Steiner learned he would never be able to wrestle again. And here is the closing part of the speech on this tribute video. It is with this tribute that we at World Championship Wrestling and the entire Turner family wish to send our sincerest thanks to Scott Steiner. For all of his years of dedication, hard work, entertainment, and his friendship. Thank you, Scott. There will never be another man quite like you to grace the squared circle. Well, that's true. This sport is a better place, which makes no sense, because of your involvement, and we will never forget your contribution. Good luck to you. As you embark on perhaps the most challenging battle of your life, Scott, we're all in your corner. Oh, heart wrenching. So awesome. So the Steiners come out for this promo, which means we get to hear Steiner line for maybe the last time on Nitro. Yes, last time ever. Scott is dewy eyed. Oh, Scott says, you know what? I had a speech, but I watched that video. Just brought me to tears. And he's he's Rick, literally weeping. Rick hugs him and leaves. And yeah, Scott is weeping. And then, you know what? Look at that video package. I believe this guy has been moved to tears. I did, yes. He's talking about degenerative discs and surgery. The doctors told him he'll never... Er, doctors told him to retire. The toughest part of all this, he says, I'll never be able to wrestle with my brother again. Oh. At this point, Rick had left to give Scott his time. And he stopped at the top of the ramp to turn around and look at him in sadness. Oh, this is all so tragic. For Scott's last words, please, everyone, please say a prayer for me. So he is done, and he goes to leave. But out comes the NWO. They bury his ass. Bret Hart was off his game last week, to put it kindly. He was on fire here. 
Truth is, Scott, you're never that good anyway. Get your stinking ass out of the ring. We don't have time for a washed up nobody like you. They bury him for a while. A production geek is telling them to go to commercial. So Jeff Jarrett levels him with a guitar. Yeah. A random WCW production employee is attacked by a wrestler with a guitar. There will be no repercussions for this. No, nah, Bill Bush doesn't care about that. The guy probably yeah. sucked at his job, I guess. Yeah. So they do go to break. When they come back, the NWO is still in the ring. They're just uh, babbling on and on. They're calling the fans pussies or calling the fans assholes. If you pay attention to what they were saying here, I'm pretty sure Jeff thought they were still in commercial. He may have. It's just... It's, they just all these local references about Houston fans and the Astrodome, and they should call it the Asshole Dome. It's just... It's, it's just... Like, I've seen this before. Yeah. And I, I realize we're watching this in 2018, and, like, we keep seeing it for years and years and years, but, I mean, when you watch this show week by week by week, and they're just going back to the goddamn NWO again in... in literally, it's, we're in 2000 now. I, I know we're, it's the 27th or whatever, but we're in the year 2000. They're going back to the NWO again. Mm-hmm. And, and it's not even like it's something new. They're doing the same shit from 1996. We tag people... We we hit the production guy because that's edgy or whatever. We do the cheap heat yelling at the people. It's just so lame. It is. It's terribly lame. Nash is rambling about Bill Bush. I love when they do this. It's like, yeah, everybody that works there, y'all know who Bill Bush is. Okay? Us fans, we have no fucking clue who this guy is, nor do we give a shit. He's out there talking about Bill Bush and belts, and it's like, who cares? Like, how could anyone possibly care about this? I didn't. Play that much. So they run down the Astrodome and Goldberg and Sid and Benoit. And finally, Sid drives his tagged Cadillac down the aisle to ringside so he and Benoit can get out and attack them with baseball bats. Yeah. And I'm trying to figure out why in the fuck did Sid drive his car into the arena and down the ramp to get these guys. That makes no sense. And the reason is, after the NWO leaves, Kurt Hennig, for absolutely no reason, attacks two men who are carrying baseball bats. They hit him with their baseball bats that they are carrying, and the payoff is they throw him over the top rope, and he takes a bump on the hood of the car, and that's it. Yep. It was so important to get a guy going over the top rope and bumping on the hood of a car, they had to have him just run out for no reason. To take this bump. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't going to be Nash. And, you know, Brett's head was probably killing him. Yeah. I don't know what Jared's problem was. I guess I guess they wanted to keep his heat. So, he yeah, poor, smart poor Kurt no. Henning just has to run out just to get thrown under the hood of a car. <laughs> but we believe that they're very concerned with wrestler safety. Yes. It's very important. This show was in Houston. Yes. Texas. Yes. The Astrodome. Forget where last week's show was. Maybe it was in the eastern seaboard, but they flew the revolution to Washington, D.C. to cut a one-minute promo in front of the White House. Vinny. How many were there? Four? I believe so, yes. And, and a cameraman. Were, five? Okay. And, and so. whoever was the random guy in the mask. Yeah, so probably about, I'd say, 2500 bucks to fly him there and back. How much did that Cadillac cost that they ran over at the end of the show? That's a fair point. Yeah, that's a fair point. I mean, it's, it's just as much these the, the, those six people. They, they had to spend a whole day flying to DC and back to film this. That's true. Yeah. You know, Dave and the Observer loved this, and I was all excited for it because it's got like Shane Douglas and everything. But they're standing for the White House. A fake Clinton shows up. They do bad comedy, and it's over in like thirty seconds. Yeah. So, I don't know if maybe there was another one that got cut from the show and the technical difficulties. I guess that's possible. That would make me feel better about the whole thing. Yeah, this was just like a load of shit. This sucked. All it is is Shane Douglas saying, Bill Clinton is your president. His whole administration is built on scandals and lies, which... Anyway. And the payoff is Perry Saturn finds a guy in a Bill Clinton mask and chases him down with a giant butterfly net and catches him. And if I've made that sound in any way funny or entertaining or amusing, I apologize. That's not my intent. Because it was none of those things. It was none of those things. A lethal lottery match. Norman Smiley and Asia. Yes. For those of you not paying attention, that's a woman. Versus Asia's friend Perry Saturn. Yes. 
who is teaming with their enemy, Hacksaw Duggan. Yes, all correct. The World Tag Team titles go to the winner of this tournament. Yes. So Hacksaw begins by assaulting and beating up his own partner. He punches him, he clotheslines him, he body slams him, and then he goes to stand on the corner in anticipation of a tag, and Saturn just gets up and he just wrestles this match. What? Why would you ever sign a lethal lottery tournament for the tag team titles? You know what I'm saying? You're you will asking end up for with it. you will end up you're you are destined to end up with a tag team cha- with tag team champions who suck. Or or because it's lethal lottery, every team sucks because yeah. they're just random people put together that have no experience teaming together. Mm-hmm. Which means at the end of the tournament, your champions, the two least shitty individuals pairing up, they're still going to be the shittiest tag team on the roster because all of the other tag teams are experienced. So why would you ever, if this were real, sign a lethal lockdown tournament to determine it tag team champions? Unless you were an idiot. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a way you could do it where like a mismatched team comes together and actually does work as a team. And well, you, that, sure, there, but still, be a story to tell there. Still, at the end of the tournament, I mean, they're they're a mismatched team competing with all of the other veteran teams. Yeah, they're at a disadvantage as champions. If it, you know what, would it be a much better if they instead of winning actually winning the tag team titles, if they got a title shot? That would be a thousand times better. Okay. okay, because then if they get their title shot and they actually can win the titles from the actual champions, then they have accomplished something and they have credibility. There you go. Okay. Yes. It, it, what, what you're doing here is just every idiot Every idiot team is facing every other idiot team, and the idiot team that's the least idiotic wins. That is what happens. Yes. So Saturn is beating up Norman, but then, like a dumbass, he drops his top rope elbow onto Norman's chest protector. Norman's in there in goddamn armor, and Saturn drops his elbow right across the armor, hurts his arm. Asia tags in. Saturn doesn't want to fight her. She low blows him. She superplexes him, which is so, so, so scary. Fuck, you should have seen her trying to shoot low below him. He's like non positioned, so she's like lunging at his genitals. Yeah. So the ref gets distracted by something. Hacksaw attacks Saturn again. He covers Saturn and counts his own pin. He leaves. Norman actually pins Saturn. And then Hacksaw beats up everyone with his stick and celebrates with his family. Yeah, his family was there. That was at least nice. We had a we had a happy ending, kind of. Even he though his a lovely family, his team lost. Yeah, I think, Kidman walks backstage. Yeah, Norman and Asia won. Got it. Yeah. Billy Kidman versus Jeff Jarrett. For a short time, this was very fun. Yeah, this was fine. It's just hard to give a shit about any of this because nothing matters. And you know, inevitably, someone's going to come out and interfere. And sure enough, Nash and Brett come out. They start attacking Kidman. Hold on, hold on. Allow me. I wrote copious notes, okay? It's Kidman versus Jarrett. Nash comes out to watch. Nash yanks the top rope down right in front of the referee, causing Kidman to fly over to the floor. Not a DQ. Filthy animals come out. They attack Jarrett in the aisle. The referee is looking right at them. Not a DQ. Nash goes after the filthy animals. Ray hits Jarrett with a crutch right in front of the referee. Not a DQ. Jarrett kicks out. Kidman hits a powerbomb into the face buster, at which point Bobby Heenan says, Never saw anything like that. Yeah. Well, except for every fucking single Kidman match there's ever been. Kidman goes up top. Nash crotches him right in front of the referee. Not an EQ. <laughs> Jarrett hits a stroke for the pin. Okay, listen. <laughs> okay. This was Mickey J. And believe it or not, it was not Nick Patrick. How can you be so bad at your job? Do you understand what I'm saying? There was like five examples of interference here in this match. It's one thing if like you're paying attention to the match and you accidentally see something you're not supposed to see one time. He accidentally saw what he was not supposed to see every single time. Was he so invested in this match as a fan that he had to see every single thing that happened? What happened here? And it's, it's not just that. There were no, never less than two, and often up to like five or six people around ringside. 
He had much opportunity to be distracted. He was the worst referee I've ever seen during this match, and that is saying something. So, the only things I can add to this are at one point after Brett and Nash interfered and Kidman kept kicking out of everything anyway, and he is so bored of this, he just says, Come on, Jarrett, pin the goof. And then uh, uh, then the announcers uh, yell at him. <laughs> He's like, not a can, goof. Can you give him a little bit of credit? Yeah. Bobby's like, who cares? The other thing is that in this melee here between the Filthy Animals and the NWO, it's only a couple of seconds long, but hey, we got to watch Bret Hart and Eddie Guerrero trading punches. Benoit. That, no, is it Bret? Bret and Bret Benoit. Hart and, and Eddie Guerrero were trading punches here. Eddie Guerrero? Yeah. Oh, yeah, he was out there. You're right. Yeah. Oh, so that's kind of cool. Who cares? I'm done. <laughs> I've hit my wall. Well, we still this have... Is, this is like, what I'm doing over Christmas break, dude. I'm watching yes. Raw, SmackDown, and this show. Yeah. Gene Oakland then tells us what you are about to see is a total mockery. Thank God he told me that, because I thought this was the real Sting. <laughs> we may not have ever figured out what's going on. Sting comes out as Luger in a, in a wig. Yes. And I think Gene, Gene said something like a nice weave or something like that. Nice, nice uh, rug. Rug. That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So, so, well, first off, I just got to get this out. Luger's trying to be Sting, and so he's doing Sting's woo. But for some reason, he's going, ow, like he's a wolf man <laughs> every time. Yes. Is it that hard? <laughs> that made it better, though. I guess it kind of did. <laughs> he's so funny being a horrible Sting. Even Liz is laughing. He's just awful, but that makes it funny. It was funny, but like, I mean, is anyone clamoring to see Sting get his hands on Luger? <laughs> we just want to see more Luger being funny. That, that, this is that, extremely that, ineffective. That's true. That is true. So, I don't know if we ever talked about this, but the angle of the pay-per-view was Liz... Uh, Sting gave Liz the fake mace, but then she just hit him with a baseball bat anyway. Hit him in the face with a baseball bat. We are told that Sting has broken wrists... Plural, bro- broken wrists. Yeah, how'd that happen? And a fractured skull. I guess he hit him in the face hard and his wrists broke. <laughs> I think maybe they were trying to say ribs. But I accidentally still... Said wrists. So Sting will return at the end of January, we are told. And this goes on for a bit with Lex doing his hysterically awful fake Sting. The lights go out. There's a thunderclap. Eventually the lights come up. Gene is gone. But there are black roses in the ring. When the announcer says, black roses, that's the symbol of death. <laughs> yeah. D- did, did Gene die? And, well, I mean, it's, it's, it's a Who's message. Dead? It's a message, Vinny. Sting is dropping black roses because Luger is going to be dead. Now, to answer your earlier question, Brian, I must admit the crowd was, in fact, clamoring for Sting here. Well, okay. I watched and I just thought, you know what? I don't want Sting to come back because he's going to ruin my fun. <laughs> he's going to ruin Lex Luger entertaining me. Backstage, okay, I don't know if we, we... Do we talk about Scott Hall? Well, I mean, we know he's not there, and thus okay. they have to vacate the titles. He didn't show Scott up Scott Hall has been stripped of the tag titles for not showing up to the building on time. Yes. But! Through the grace of their hearts... They have offered to put him back into the tournament if he can show up by the end of the show. What? <laughs> Vinny. What? Vinny. It's, it's, it's actually worse. They stripped Hall of the titles. It's a punishment, right? Yeah. Okay. So if he shows up, he didn't show up by seven, okay? So they stripped him of the titles. <sighs> But if he shows up by 10, they will allow him to enter a lethal lottery tournament with his own partner. Yes. So it's not just that they're letting him back into the tournament for the belts that they stripped from him, Vinny. They're letting him back in with an extreme advantage over every other fucking team. Yes. This is the worst show. Yeah, I... Of all time. This is the worst one. I know we've said that before. <laughs> this is this is getting there. As we get over this, as we go over this show, I realize this was the worst Nitro. So I bring up Scott Hall because in this clip, 
Nash is on the phone with him. Keeps calling him Scott. He's giving him directions to the Houston Astrodome. <laughs> well, Vinny, it's Scott Hall. It's a big domed building, he says. Well, yeah, but I mean, if you're in downtown Seattle, it might be hard to find that key reading, you know? A lot of one ways. This is the least of our problems, Vinny. Our next match. Here's one for you. <laughs> okay. Seriously, help me out here. All right? Please. It's Finley and Ming, Lethal Lottery, against... The two men who used to be creative control. Yes. Okay. Now they are the Harris boys. Okay, hold on a second. So when they first came out, I thought, all right, so the powers that be, Vince Russo, want creative control to win. Therefore, in this lethal lottery tournament, they're allowing them to be put together as a team, right? Uh, sure. Sure. I mean, I, no I, announcer mentioned this. No. But that's the first thing that I thought. But then I realized they're not wrestling in their creative control attire. No. They're, they're in, like, tank tops and shit. That's Ron and Don Harris. They announced that they're now the Harris boys. And they're no longer aligned with the powers that be. So you're now telling me that they're no longer aligned with the powers that be, but they have been allowed by the powers that be to team up together in the lethal lockdown? Or are we supposed to believe that this was, like, a random draw? This was draw? a random draw, Brian. Dude. This is just a coincidence. That's how fucking stupid they are. Jesus, God almighty. So Meng hits the ring. He just starts brawling with Finley before the other team's even announced. This So I, I, I'm not doing the math, but there's three or four of these matches, and every single one, somebody's attacked their own partner. Tony Schiavone outright says, we've seen this all too many times tonight. They keep on fighting. The Harrises come out. There's briefly an actual tag match going on, and then Meng and Finley keep fighting, and they fight up the aisle, and they get counted out. Fuck you. Yep. Schiavone here says, as... As they're getting counted out, like they're getting farther away from the ring, Shivani is sure to point out the Harrises are doing a very smart thing here by d just sitting on their ass and not following them to get counted out themselves. Very smart. Yeah, Tony like, Shivani is very impressed. It's like a Warrior Roland. Extreme intelligence. <sighs> so they brawl up the aisle just forever. They're fighting. Their fight at the aisle after the count out legit longer than the actual match itself. Then the lights go out again. A mysterious figure attacks the Harrises. He's supposed to disappear, but the lights come on early and he has to run away. <laughs> I watch this over and over. There is a dude. He appears on camera right between like the ref and one of the Harrises. He jumps to his feet. He is wearing a Tommy Hilfiger sweatshirt so you can spot him. He shrugs. For like a long time, asking, what the fuck is going on? He drops his arms. He's looking at the aisle, trying to figure out what's happening. And you see him do like a violent shrug again, as if to say, who the fuck was that? This is the worst show of all time. It's up there. David and Daphne are backstage watching a movie in the dark, calling themselves the Natural Born Killers. Yeah. Here is where we cut to the middle of Vampiro beating up three count. Yeah. We, did. we just we just cut back and three count is dancing. <laughs> I'm yeah. like, when the fuck did three count debut? Why is Evan Courageous suddenly in a boy band? Vampiro's beating him up and it leads to Okay, okay, I okay, I gotta take over. Now I'm really getting agitated. The show's awful, man. My family's here. I'm trying to really just reel it in, but you want me to go? I can... No, 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 no. I must, I must talk about this, okay? So, they announced Evan Courageous and Vampiro are partners here in this Lethal Lottery. Their opponents tonight are David Flair and the Maestro. What a coinkadink! What a crazy random draw. David Flair and the Maestro have been feuding. He's been terrorizing Symphony. Now they are partners. Yes. Who'd have thunk it? How wacky! So, it's supposed to be Maestro, but Crowbar 
debuts, Devin Storm, Crowbar takes his crowbar and he beats up the maestro. The maestro is dead. Okay? Are you with me now? I follow you, yes. Okay. So David Flair's partner has been killed and he is now unavailable. Correct? Okay. Yes, that is a good point, Brian. So then Crowbar walks to the ring and he is allowed to be the new partner of David Flair. So what you're telling me, Mm -hmm. you fucking idiots, is that you have arranged a lethal lottery where everybody must have a random partner, and because a guy beat up his partner, he's now allowed to choose his own partner who happens to be his friend? Yeah. This, This is bullshit. It's completely unfair. And, and, I didn't even think about this till just now. Do you know I got an Apple Watch for Christmas? An Apple Watch? Yeah, and it monitors my heart rate. I, I should I should literally go through my heart rate as I as I do this recap here. So later in the show, not to do much of a spoiler here, but it's supposed to be Kevin Nash and Scott Hall versus The Wall and Sid, okay? Hall doesn't show up. No. And... We are explicitly fucking told 20 minutes later that Nash can't just choose any replacement partner he wants. No. He can't just choose Jeff Jarrett or Bret Hart. He can only tag in the lethal lottery with the partner with whom he was assigned. Meanwhile, 20 fucking minutes earlier, a guy beats up his goddamn partner, and his buddy who helped him beat him up comes out, and he replaces the guy in the team. This, this video, you're right. I was wrong. This is the dumbest show I've ever watched in my life. It's horrible. It's unforgivable. Now, the rest of this is small potatoes compared to all that, but I must comment on some of this. This is not small potatoes. At the end of this review, I wrote, this show is your brain on drugs. Just because of this segment here. So the maestro comes out. I don't know if we've mentioned this, but the maestro's piano music, I think it's just Paul Orndorff's Mr. Wonderful theme without the, the vocals. Now, the music starts to play, all right? They cut the entranceway where there's a piano on a platform. And the maestro walks up to the piano, and he turns his back, and he walks away from the piano. They would do all this trouble to have a piano out there when he didn't even play it. And then he just gets killed by Crowbar anyway. So Crowbar comes out. We are told that on Thunder, Crowbar was working at a filling station. Oh, my God. I remember this. (laughs) And that is where David Flair and Daphne found him. Oh, my God. I remember this. So this guy from the Chevron gets in this ring, and he's better than half the crew. (laughs) Dude. He's doing suplexes. He's doing flipping somersault leg drops. He's holding his own against Vampiro. <laughs> this this grease monkey is putting everyone to shame. So there is more bullshit here. Maybe the name of the place was Spot Monkey. Hey, there you go. Hey. So three count gets back involved. Vampiro's fighting with them. Daphne is out there. They're using weapons. I could not for the life of me. I was trying to write down everything that happened, and I gave up. There's a lot of shit going on. Uh, Crowbar hit Vampiro with a pipe with help from three count. So David gets the pin. Evan is wanting this, and after the pin realizes, hey, wait, I just lost. So he's fucked himself. At this point, Three Count says, oh, well, they clear the ring so they can dance again. There is, I didn't even know they had uh, uh, what uh, royalty-free music with vocals. Oh, sure they do, of course. <laughs> There's some awful copyrighted, uncopyrighted boy band pop being played in as they start to dance. 
One of the very few moments of joy in the show was David Flair in the ring behind them, dancing along them, <laughs> alongside with them, and really dancing better than them. Yes. They beat them up with a crowbar. So we've had this bullshit uh, before the match with Empire and Three Count. We had this bullshit match with tons of interference. We've had this bullshit after the match where the dancers get beat up by the other guys. There's more bullshit, everyone. This segment will not die. Fucking Lenny and Lodi are out there. They are now standards and practices. They are accompanied by Miss Hancock, who we already know uh, was introduced as Stacy Keebler. I'd forgotten her name. Yeah. <laughs> I wrote down Stacy Keebler. I remember now. Oh, my God. So they're out there. This is their debut. They tell David and Crowbar to behave themselves. And now Crowbar and David beat them up. This is one segment. <laughs> this was where I wrote, this show is your brain on drugs. Dude. So David and Crowbar, pause? I need to take it. I need to, to, to rest. <laughs> David and Crowbar beat them up with weapons. Stacy calmly just steps out of the ring. Oh, she steps out of the ring. My men are being beaten. I must leave. Her, her, my men are being attacked with weapons. It's time for me to go. And as I leave, I shall step to the ropes and keep my legs straight and bend all the way over the waist to show my ass to the camera. Of course, get with the program, Vinny. It's very important that she does this as her men are being destroyed and with weapons. So, by the way, long before the fake three can music started and Daphne began making out with David, before that even happened, Tony Schiavone says, this is the craziest thing I've ever seen. It continues. We have the fake three can music. Daphne makes out with David. Standards and practice debuts. Stacey, Stacey Keebler's out there. Miss Hancock. Daphne or David and Crowbar beat up standards and practices. Stacey leaves the ring. She bends over. Finally, Tony Schiavone wraps it up saying, that is as bizarre a segment as you'll ever find on this program. He throws to break. <laughs> he just gave up. This segment was unbelievably bad. How many debuts? Let me count how many debuts we had in one segment. Are you ready? Sure. Uh, we had three count. All right. So that's at least two. Shane I won't, Shane Helms. I won't count Evan Courageous. All right. Okay. It's two. We had Crowbar debuted. Three. We had, uh, I'm trying to get through the match here, uh, standards and practices. I guess standards and practices. You know what? I'm going to count standards and practices as a new it, act. It's their new gimmick. Yep. That's, and and Stacey Keebler is now Miss Hancock. That's another one. That's six. A six, yeah. Six debuts. You know what's funny is like a couple of months ago we were just talking about, think about how many things take place between now and when the company dies in 2001. Like we got... We got huge erection, all this other bullshit. <laughs> okay, and it's like, God, how the fuck do they do? They how does it, like Lance hasn't even showed up yet? And it's like, how in the world, Mike? Awesome, I could go on and on. But anyway, now we know they debut six people in one segment on one show. We could do. We could debut seven hundred people between now and March of two thousand one. I might debut on Nitro soon. <laughs> it's very possible. I've forgotten that we're going to show up there. The NWO is backstage bickering. They want to know where Scott is. Can Nash tells them Scott will be here. There's all sorts of audio problems in this horrible, awful, miserable television show. Now, this is explained by the end, but they've been in line for one week, and they were already bickering here. Even I fixed our audio issues on this show. Yeah, it wasn't that hard. You told me to do it. I know nothing. You know nothing. I had to have Vinny plug in boxes. I had to have Vinny find IPs. I had to have Vinny turn down gain. But it it took it took nine minutes for me to get the audio in order here. These fucking guys are going on three hours. It still sucks. Lethal lottery match: Canyon and Buff Bagwell versus Disco Inferno and Big Vito. Brian, it, it, it's funny how this all worked out. By the luck of the random draw, Disco's teaming with his new buddy Big Vito. Crazy, and Canyon and Buff are feuding. It's nuts. Were they? Yeah, I think so. I've forgotten. I mean, maybe not. I think everyone's feuding with everybody, but listen, I'm a fair man. Fans were super into Buff getting the win here. That's a positive. And I've said it before, I'll say it again, Big Vito was fucking great. <laughs> he was awesome on this show. He was great. Johnny the Bull doesn't do anything yet, no. so he's he's still great. And Tony Mamaluke is just an incredibly annoying Tony Mamaluke. Their music is awesome. It is a fantastic act. It saved the show for me in some ways. Still, the worst show I've ever seen. But <laughs> I mean, it was, it was this was this was a bright spot. 
It was still so, stupid. So Canyon comes out with the ladies. That's what the graphic actually reads. Chris Champagne Canyon with ladies. <laughs> Dude. <laughs> Johnny the Bull and Tony Marinero are hitting on the ladies. This angers Canyon. So he doesn't just send the women backstage. He goes with them. And as he is going up the ramp with his women, Bobby Heenan, dripping with scorn, just says, Fence builder. <laughs> I so love that Buff doesn't care that his partner left without him. He laughs it all off. The match keeps going. Eventually, Disco accidentally hits Vito with a chain. Buff pins Vito with a blockbuster. The Italians order Disco, who's not part of the family, to attack Buff. Reluctantly, he does, and they beat him up, and I think that's the end. I think some people, I think a lot of people probably know this, especially if you're longtime listeners, but Canyon, the late Chris Canyon, was one of my best friends in wrestling. And I'm so sad that he's gone. I, I, I... Do you know how much fun we would have with him? Oh my going god! Over these shows, I was. Just, I never spoke to him myself. I was just thinking about this, and I was thinking about the Christmas show and how unbelievably awesome he'd have been on the Christmas show, and yeah, how much fun we would have had going back over these shows again. It's depressing. Yeah, watching late nineties wrestling is often depressing, but that like I understand that it's a personal note. I mean, think about this. I mean, we had so much fun laughing about this shit when it was happening. Like, <laughs> imagine looking back today. Yeah. Uh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Kevin Nash walks backstage. We then get what is announced as Kevin Nash and Scott Hall. Again, the random draw has put two partners together. Versus Sid, who's feuding with them, and a true random name in The Wall. <laughs> well, finally a random name. <laughs> that wall is very random here. I will concede that. So Scott Hall is still not there. Nash asks for more time. It's the end of a three-hour show. <laughs> yeah. He does not get we have any four time. hours. That's what this show needs. <laughs> he does not we're we're get... about to go to two hours. Give us one more hour this last week. He does not get any more time, and he is told that Bret Hart and Jeff Jarrett cannot wrestle with him. He must go it alone. You must. You, you can only have your original partner, is what he's told. So we get Kevin Nash in a two-on-one match against the Wall and Sid Advantage Babyfaces. Of course, yeah. At least... I don't think the wall is a baby face, though. Whatever. At Actually, least Nash's friends, while not technically in the match, were frequently interfering to at least give the illusion, or try to give the impression, that he had the numbers on his side. So eventually, it, most of this match is Kevin Nash versus the wall one-on-one, -on -one, if you can imagine that. It actually was funny, because... it. it there's a point where I, I guess Wall didn't get the memo about Nash not liking to bump. Because he grabs it for a back suplex. And the look on Nash's face is like, oh no. And Wall just throws him up and then he just throws him down. <laughs> you won't see Nash bump like this very often. So finally, Sid, after all this interference, he loses his mind. He hits the ring without a tag. He throws the ref, the ref away. And he throws what I... I know I'm given to hyperbole on the show, and I know there's some recency bias here, but I promise you, Sid hit Kevin Nash with the funniest punch of his entire career. <laughs> he throws that elbow back, and that fist is all balled up, but pointing the wrong way, and he's leaning back on one leg, and that other leg is high up in the air, pointing forward. I cackled and cackled and cackled. So, Sid is attacking... In this brawl, the wall punches Bret Hart, who has suffered a career in concussion by now. Punches him right in the head. The Nash hits the wall with a baseball bat and pins him. That's the end of the match. Benoit hits the ring. There's a huge melee going on. By the way, I want to mention that when he hit him with the bat, Sid was beating up Jeff Jarrett in the ring. This was not a disqualification. No, no, I've been that. Who cares? So Benoit comes out, and Scott Steiner limps out. He's got a bat, and he's got his back brace. And then, you'll never guess, everyone, he hit Sid with his bat. Oh, I can't even believe it. Are you kidding he, me? It was a swerve the whole time. And he pulls off his back brace, and he pulls off his shirt, and he's got an NWO shirt on. And the answer say, hey, they said Scott would be here. And that's Scott. 
Ah, oh, what a swerve. Don't we all feel dumb for not seeing that coming? Actually, on the swerve scale, that's a great one, actually. <laughs> so He promises Scott, and Scott showed up. I lost track of how, but Sid's car was at ringside again. Yeah, they drove it out there. That's how so, Sid showed up in it, I think. I forget. But he's out there. They throw him in the passenger seat. They all get in the car. There's no room to for, for, for Big Sexy. So Nash gets on the hood of the car and just hangs on for dear life. And they weren't slipping on ice. But people have gotten hurt doing stuff less stupid than this. Well, let's be perfectly honest here. This could have been Nash going into business for himself. It absolutely could have. Yeah. This is more common on the era than any one particular individual outside of Nash, who was the one sitting on the hood, sitting on the hood of a car trying to hang on with one hand and look cool with his other. So they drive into the parking lot. <laughs> they all get out. And... I remembered that at some point Brett drives a car and slips on ice, but yes. I, I thought it was going to happen here. It's not what happened here. But maybe been on thunder this, actually. Maybe it is thunder. I think it is because it was the uh, the punching the the same angle. I, I think it might have been actually. Okay, okay. Well, Brett gets out of the car here and he starts running. You've never seen Brett Hart run this fast. He's running as fast as he possibly can. Maybe they told him they're going to go off the air soon, but he runs away. And then the monster truck drives up. We are led to believe Bret Hart is driving it and that Sid is still inside the Cadillac. And the monster truck drives over the Cadillac. And now Sid's dead. And that's the end of the show. This is bad. Dude. <laughs> this was absolutely horrible. What a horrendous television show. Yeah. They all run together, Vinny. They do. I mean, I'll you, take your word for that this one was the worst because it was really, really bad, but... I think well, I'm just I'm numb to it now. The first Russo show was horrendous. The next one I remember being even worse. And then it felt like for two or three weeks they leveled off. We got numb to the bullshit. But I'm pretty sure that this on the whole was worse than any of those other ones. It was certainly worse in in, 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 in more diverse ways. We never seen a show, I don't think, that had this many technical issues. Well, that's true. I mean that we that didn't even was talk terrible. about there was stuff that was outright cut. There's other stuff that they, they had to run with a disclaimer because the audio was so terrible they couldn't fix it. Yeah. And there was random scratches and hisses the entire segment. That's true. I mean, production-wise, but it was also shorter, Vinny. Well, that makes it better. We did have to watch 25 extra minutes. That That is a fair point. That's fucking tough. I, I still I think, have... Vinny, I think we can safely say yeah. this was one of the top three worst wrestling television shows we've ever seen. Is that fair? It's the worst, it's the worst one I've seen this week for sure. Well, for sure this week, yeah. Raw, Raw and SmackDown were like... They should they should get Emmys compared to this this shit. Now somehow, even though we missed twenty minutes, I still seem to have written about a thousand words on the finishes. Well, I don't have the music, so you're just gonna have to do the finishes without it. I shall do my best. The, flow, the floor is yours, Vinny. The finishes on this miserably bad television show were <laughs> pin in a hardcore match that we couldn't see. Pin in a tag match after partners turn on each other. And a brawl broke out, and a woman interfered, and another woman interfered, and a janitor hit a guy in a two-by-four, all in two minutes. <laughs> Knockout in 30 seconds. Pin in a tag match after a guy gets beat up by his own partner, and his friend on the other team, and a guy with armor. Pin after interference from at least five guys, with at least two weapons. Count out when two guys decided they'd rather fight each other than their opponents. Pin after one guy walks out on his partner and another guy hits his partner with a chain. Pin in a handicap match. Is this over yet? Advantage baby faces. Jesus. With all sorts of interference. Oh my god. This this is wrestling on acid. I I wrote that earlier. This show is your brain on drugs. Horrible. One of the exhausted. top three worst nitros of all time. But hey, it's the final three hour show. They went out with a bang.